probably looking for parking places, but we do have a quorum. And so we will start the uh, November 7th meeting of the Humboldt County Planning Commission and we'll start with the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd ask the clerk to take a roll call, please. Commissioner Levy? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Morris? Here. And Commissioner O'Neill? Here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, next item on this been agendized is for uh, public comments that are not on the agenda tonight. Anyone wishing to speak on non-agendized items that are under the purview of this commission, which are the, our land use, may approach the podium at this time. And I would ask that you please keep your comments to three minutes. We have a packed room. I think it's going to be a long night. Go ahead. <clears throat> Ken Sawatsky, I'm going to ask that you maybe set up a workshop with uh, your staff sometime to change how you agendize your items. And I. I uh, was speaking with Director Ford the other day. It's like this particular meeting, the agenda reflects what the project was originally. And it's morphed a great deal. And John said, well, you have to go through the other documents to see exactly how it's changed. And he told me where I could go and things. But still, I think the agenda should be forced to be a current agenda for what you're considering the project before you. I think that's, that's important because I just like to read just the agenda and be, get an idea, whereas I was reading it and I, I, it was completely um, different. And here's an example. Um, the exact footprint of individual WT, I don't have my glasses, within the project site will be determined during the engineering uh, design and uh, it basically is quite vague as far as that be. It say be placed along Monument Ridge probably and, and it doesn't really represent to the public what your project is tonight. And it just, it, I, I tried to get through to him that I, I didn't know how you could act on a project that is agendized, not the project before you. So that was of great concern to me. Um, the other thing I wish to report out was a little bit of a, a land use thing that happened Tuesday in the supervisor chambers. And uh, it was regarding uh, a road that they were trying to get Rio Dell here, and I see the, the mayors here and things. But they were trying to get uh, basically the county to help fund a section of Monument Ridge Road that was within Rio Dell kind of as a benefit. Um, and this was brought forward the, uh, I guess Rio Dell didn't agree that the per specific project EIR reflected that that need to be addressed in the EIR. And apparently it's not addressed in there. And yet three of the supervisors said, well, this is appears to be a problem, it should be addressed, it should have been in the EIR, and Estelle finally said no matter what, people are going to use that road and it needs to be mitigated. And so um, that's kind of what transpired with I think three of the supervisors all chiming in saying that that should have, should have be addressed for the Monument Ridge Road, which they were considering prior to you guys taking any action on anything affecting that. And so to me, um, that bothered me because it appeared the EIR already was three supervisors said it was flawed and uh, you may be getting more comments regarding that this evening. So thank you for my opportunity to speak on this. Maybe we can get the agenda to be a little bit more specific and I do understand the logic, but if the project changes, the agenda should change also. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to comment on items that are not on the agenda tonight, please approach the podium. Anyone? Seeing no one, we'll close this section of public comment, and I'll, I'd like the record to note that uh, Commissioner uh, Brian and Commissioner Melanie have uh, joined us. Uh, and uh, with that, we'll move along to the uh, main agenda item, and uh, what I will do is I will turn it over to the director and let the director introduce it. Thank you, Chair. I, I really don't want to do the full introduction. The staff is going to do that, but I did want to introduce the staff who are unfamiliar faces largely to the commission and perhaps to the public. Uh, we have Elizabeth Burks, who has been working on this project as a county uh, contract planner, and uh, you may 
remember Miss Burks from her time working as a planner with the county. So we were really happy to have her working on this project. And then in order to prepare, you, you all know Steve Warner, and then in order to uh, prepare the environmental impact report, we uh, consulted with a, a firm, AECOM. And so we have uh, the project manager and uh, two of the other project leads here that have worked on that. Uh, there's Petra Unger and Dr. Susan Sanders and Ken Koch, who uh, is sitting in the first row. <coughs> and uh, one of the things that is really important for the commission to just be aware right off the bat is that this EIR that was prepared was prepared under contract to the county. And so it has been really a county document that's been prepared. And so as we present it tonight, we present it from the perspective of the county who has prepared it. With that, I'll turn it over to the staff to present the uh, item. If, for, just for one moment, a little housekeeping for everyone. What my plan is tonight, since this is a big project and we have a full house, what I would like to do is we'll get the staff to do their report. Then I would like the applicant to come up and such it's, it's such a complex, large project, I would like the applicant to make a presentation. I will then allow the commissioners to uh, ask questions on either the staff report or anything that may have come up in the applicants. Following that, we may, we'll, depending upon the time, we may take a recess or I will open up for public comment. So that, sh that will be the procedure tonight, so go ahead. Thank you, Chair Morris. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Beth Burks, and as John said, I am the sign planner for this project. So this is the Humboldt Wind Energy Project. It's a proposal for a 155 megawatt wind energy facility, and it is a conditional use permit and a special permit. And the purpose of this hearing tonight is really to uh, explain the project and then walk you through the final EIR, which we know is a massive document. So we're hoping that tonight can um, you know, really help you understand the document, how to read it, understand the project a little better, but no action is expected tonight. As Chair Morris said, um, that would come at uh, a future public hearing uh, scheduled for next week. <coughs> So here's the overview of the presentation this evening. Uh, uh, we will give the project introduction, you know, describing the project and its location and how the project has changed uh, since the draft EIR and how it's been refined in the final EIR. Uh, we'll cover the regulatory setting, um, you know, the findings of the EIR and the process we've been through, uh, and then, uh, Judging by what Chair Morris just said, we'll, we'll swap these last couple items, which is that we'll have an applicant presentation, we'll have the clarifying questions, and then public comments. So we are on the same page here. So project location and components. <coughs> this project would place turbines on Monument Ridge and Bear River Ridge and have a gen tie that roughly follows Shively Ridge Road. It's a little difficult to see here, and I apologize for that, but uh, turbine locations would be here, um, and we're looking at um, a gen tie roughly following. If you can see the orange outline, what that represents is a study corridor. And this is really important because in the draft EIR, we took a corridor approach so that we could do some conservative planning and also allow for some flexibility. So everything within the corridor has been studied. And what that means is it's a thousand feet centered on the, on the representative turbine location. So that and then we took 200 feet, or the applicant took 200 feet off, to, off of roadways in the Gentai and 500 feet around staging areas. So we have this wide corridor. We also study in, this, in the DEIR um, several different alternatives and those locations were studied so that we have options as we move forward so that we could do refinements. So since the issuance of the DER, the, the applicant has continued to work with the county and agencies and worked on refining the project. And if you're looking here, you'll see the project refinements are represented. Uh, the red is what is currently proposed, and the yellow is what came forward in the DEIR. And I'm going to briefly summarize the changes, and uh, then we'll have, we'll have time to go into those in more detail as we discuss uh, the details of the document. So overall, we've had a reduction in ground disturbance from 900 acres to 655 acres. Uh, we have, there is a realignment and shortening of the gen tie, and this is primarily to avoid uh, spotted owl habitat and also to be more co-located with existing roads and other infrastructure. 
Uh, there's also uh, overall reduction in the number of turbines. Originally, there were 60 turbines proposed, up to, and we always knew that number might change, but we wanted to look at it conservatively in the DER, the maximum number of turbines that would be possible, and that was 60. And now the applicant has come back and said 47 is, is the preferred option. So um, that's a reduction. Uh, we're also looking at an overhead crossing of the Gentai over the Eel River as opposed to horizontal directional drilling. Um, we'll go into that a little more, but the location of directional drilling was a little closer to Scotia, originally proposed. Um, now it's moved over to be uh, coterminous basically with a Stafford Bridge. Uh, so that is a change. There's also realignment of access roads, which we'll see here. Uh, that primarily here, but it also um, looks at making the best use of the access roads and avoiding habitat, um, best use of existing roads that are on the ground and also avoiding habitat areas and then making sure we have the turn radius for these very large loads that will be coming. There's a substation located on site, and that is uh, was originally proposed over here, uh, where the gen, uh, next to the Gentai. Um, it is now proposed um, at the location of the Gentai. The project footprint for that has changed from five acres to 2.5 acres. So this is just a continuation of showing the differences and disturbance between the final EIR at, or the draft EIR and the final, with the yellow being the draft, the red being the final, um, and heading out into the Bridgeville substation. So this is what a typical wind turbine generator looks like. So we, we refer to these as turbines or WTGs throughout the document. Um, they, the, they could be as tall as 600 feet, um, from the, the clearance from the rotor braids at their lowest point would be approximately 76 feet, and uh, they would be uh, white or light gray in color, and they would have a non-reflective finish, and they would have FAA lighting. We're not sure exactly what that's going to look like. That will be uh, uh, up to the FAA, but there will be some type of lighting on these. All right, so I'm going to walk us through a little bit of the project hull route and the offloading. So the components uh, of this of the wind turbines will come in by barge via Humboldt Bay. Um, they'll come into Fields Landing, where they will be offloaded onto the Harbor District property at Fields Landing. And from there, they will um, head southbound on the 101 after making a turn at, um, at South Bay Depot Road and, and Fields Landing Drive. So this is just for scale, and this, doc, uh, this figure was included in the draft EIR, but this kind of shows you just how large these uh, components can be. This is a blade, and that would be the largest part. I think the maximum is somewhere in the ballpark of 300 feet long. Um, they do require, um, you know, we'll have encroachment permits, of course, traffic control plans as these things travel down the highway. They'll be coordinating with Caltrans uh, to make sure that uh, traffic is, is handled when they do that. So the black line here represents the haul route. So again, they come into Fields Landing, head southbound on the 101, and then they're going to exit um, to get into the Jordan Creek staging area. And that's really uh, at the uh, Pepperwood Avenue of the Giants exit. And so um, that, that's, where they will, that's where they will exit the highway. I also wanted to mention that there would be up to 15 separate loads of equipment um, for each wind turbine generator. Most of those would be oversized loads and need permits. Um, they will be constructed in sections. So there are a couple modifications that are required in order to get these uh, <coughs> turbine components um, along the highway and, and get them to their destination. Um, the first is at Hookton, they need a Hookton bridge detour because uh, some of the components will be too tall to fit in under the overpass. And so what they'll be doing is um, constructing a temporary bypass, and this would be by placing a culvert and geotextile fabric and, uh, and have a gravel uh, way to create a, basically a 21-foot wide link between US 101 and what is the, um, the frontage road at the, wildlife, at the wildlife refuge. And so then they would, they would use the wildlife refuge road until uh, they come back onto the US 101 at the Eel River Drive off um, on-ramp. And the wildlife refuge will need to issue an encroachment permit for this. 
Similarly, at 12th Street and Fortuna, the components would be too tall to fit under the overpass there, and so there would be a detour in that location as well. Um, and it will require an encroachment permit from the city of Fortuna, and a temporary off-ramp would be constructed um, basically at the northern terminus of Dinsmore Drive, and then trucks would go south on Dinsmore Drive before re-entering the 101, um, basically at Dinsmore Drive and Riverwalk Drive. So then, uh, after traveling quite a while longer, they will get to the staging area. Um, and again, that's off the Avenue of Giants Pepperwood exit. Uh, the figure down here shows the temporary and permanent impacts related to the staging area. Um, this will also be the location of the permanent operations and maintenance building, where 15 employees will be employed for the life of the project. So. The purple here is the temporary impacts. That's about 10, or combined purple and blue um, is about a 10 acre impact. The blue is the, is the permanent area that would be impacted, and that's five acres. And up here shows you what a typical operations and maintenance building, very simple building going in that location. Uh, they will need to install a septic system uh, for the permanent workers there. Um, while it's used as a staging area during construction, this area would be used to star store large equipment uh, and materials to refuel. Uh, uh, trucks and also to um, as a collect and temporary storage location for for construction waste and they would have a temporary office space there as well so from from the staging area, they will head up the hill up to Monument Ridge, um, and this represents the revised location that is currently proposed in the FEIR. Um, and see the big switchbacks, that's to accommodate for those very uh, large loads and make sure it can accommodate the turning movements. Uh, so this realignment was contemplated in alternative two of the DEIR, and it does more to minimize the construction for footprint, and as I said, co-locate it with existing roads where possible. And uh, so the existing roads out there are approximately 10 to 12 feet wide, and the proposed improvements would consist of graded and gravel surfaces of roughly 24 feet wide, and they would need uh, 10 to 12, 20 foot wide shoulders in order to support crane movement. And then in areas with steep slopes, they, they could have up to a 200 100 foot um, wide grading area. This would be temporary disturbance just to support the, the large components coming up, up the hill. So this is just representative of the Eastern Monument Ridge turbines. Um, so this is right after you come up, up the, from the staging area, and these are the first turbine locations. Um, if you can see, purple is the temporary impacts, and the blue lines represent permanent impacts. So temporary is extra grading that might be required during construction or places they're going to put the spoils, things like that. Permanent <coughs> impacts are going to be roadways and grading and, I'm sorry, and turbine pads um, that will remain for the life of the project, which if I didn't mentioned already is 30 year life of the project is what's expected. From the time we published the DEIR till now, the applicant has reduced the overall turbine count on Monument Ridge. Um, prior we had, um, and these were just representative locations, but prior in the DEIR there were approximately 37 turbines proposed on Monument, and now there are 27 turbines proposed. This is an image of a typical turbine pad. There's kind of two options here. This top one um, showing um, a would, would be really for a flat location, which we don't, we don't have much of. So we're expecting more of this, uh, this one uh, uh, below, which is showing the grading. Um, turbine pads, essentially, once they're constructed, they'll be about three acres each. So each one of these turbines will have a three acre pad. Um, the turbine foundations would be buried to a depth of about 10 feet below grade, and then they'd have a pedestal extending about one foot above the ground. The foundation would need to be 60 to, seven, 60 to 70 feet in diameter, um, depending on what model is essentially select, is ultimately selected. Um, the pads would be leveled so that they, the slope on them doesn't exceed 2%, so that's why in some locations, uh, you know, more grading will be required than others. So this is Western Monument Ridge turbines, and you'll see here the purple again representing temporary disturbance compared to the blue, which would be the permanent disturbance. Um, and this is quite a bit more temporary disturbance on Western Monument than we saw on Eastern Monument. And that's essentially because this is the location where um, we've identified that spoils piles could be placed, and that is because there is limited uh, constraints here in terms of wetland resources um, and, str and stream crossings and things like that where, that we would want to be avoiding. And so 
because uh, there's also fewer, um, relatively fewer archaeology archaeological sites on this this spot. So um, all of that led to this being the best place we could identify that that would um, be a good place to put spoils. And all that purple area you see on there would be revegetated um, and restored after after construction. So here's the Bear River Ridge turbines, and they zoomed out a little bit on this one um, so that we could kind of see the overall location and where <coughs> these are in proximity. Um, so Bear River Ridge, Monument Ridge continues down here, but here we can see Scotia and Rio Dell. Um, this here is, um, is Monument Road, and so we have a, a condition or a mitigation measure in, in the draft EIR and, uh, that uh, requires that only light duty, tr that basically no heavy truck traffic can travel on Monument. It will all be coming up that Jordan Creek staging area. So light duty trucks, you know, typical pickup truck, they, they could head into town this way, but none of the, the heavy construction operating equipment will, will use Monument. And then here I zoomed in so you can kind of get an idea of scale in terms of temporary and permanent impacts. Hopefully it's a little easier to see. So again, the, the turbine pads um, ultimately, once constructed, would be about three acres in size. That's the, that's the permanent size. Um, the, the purple is the area that would be restored uh, after construction is complete. And you can see that um, you know, this, is, this is a barn, so you can kind of see it in relation to you know, the size of the impacts. Um, along uh, along Bear River Ridge, uh, most of the turbines here are, all, in fact, all the turbines are located on the Russ Ranch, and, and they're um, they're adjacent to Bear River Ridge Road. So that's in, which is a county road. So okay, so I like to spend a little time talking about the generation transmission line. Again, the, the, the Gentai has been reduced in size from 25 miles, or in length, I'm sorry, to, from 25 miles to 22 miles since the publication of the DEIR. And it starts at Monument Ridge and it travels um, to the point of interconnection at Bridgeville substation. And it's an overhead 150 kilovolt line. Where possible, the Gentai has been realigned and co-located with existing access roads to avoid and minimize ground disturbance. Um, it's also been, uh, reposition to hopefully minimize visual impacts and avoid uh, any activity centers related to spot spotted owls, which you'll hear more about as the presentation goes on. So just some example photos. The, um, the H-frame poles on the top are uh, the typical pole that you would find in the Gentai corridor. Um, and the example of a Gentai corridor on the bottom is actually um, similar in size. So the Gentai we expect to be 80 feet wide. Um, it does require tree removal, and some vegetation would be allowed to grow under the gentai once the trees are removed, but um, it would be pretty low, low vegetation. We're not going to have another forest popping up there because of fire hazards. So um, this is a good example of what it might look like, um, and this is actually in the Bridgeville area coming into the Bridgeville sub, um, and it's uh, roughly 50 to 80 feet wide, so I, I hope that that's a useful illustration. So the Gentai crossing at the Eel River, as I mentioned, this has changed. So originally it was going to go horizontal directional drill under the Eel River closer to Scotia. It has since uh, been proposed to change to go basically at the same height as the bridge um, there at, near Stafford. And it would uh, be... Um, basically similar to PG&E's existing transmission lines, which are located on the east side of the bridge. So um, very... Uh, and this has been done to minimize impacts, of course, related to the directional drilling. We heard comments about that, um, and also to make sure that we're at an even height so we're not posing any new hazards to uh, wildlife. So here is the rest of the Gentile a little bit closer up. Again, red representing the Gentile alignment proposed in the final EIR, and and uh, the yellow representing what was in the draft. And again, this entire study corridor was studied. So, um, and, and any, so we, we have that benefit of knowing what resources were there. When it gets to Bridgeville, um, it will require some improvements. PG&E would actually uh, be responsible for these improvements and it would expand the Bridgeville substation uh, by up to three acres. And it happens in this back area here. Um, so that would require extending the existing gravel pad to the north and east and, uh, and, and many other upgrades to the station. 
There's a few other co uh, project components. One is a temporary concrete batch plant that would be look at, located along the, um, the turbine route. Um, there is a project substation, which I, man which I mentioned, which really takes uh, its point, uh, gathers the, the energy from the wind turbines and, and gets it into the Gentai, and that's going to be located along Monument Ridge. Um, there's an underground electrical collection system for all the uh, all of the turbines. There's also a control system. There's going to be up to six permanent meteorological towers and three five-acre temporary staging areas throughout the project. So let's talk a little bit about the regulatory context and how this project is coming before your commission. So this project, as I mentioned, does require a conditional use permit, and that's because wind gener generating facilities are conditionally permitted in both TPZ and ag exclusive, which is primarily where this project is located. And so the general plan and the zone allows for wind generating facilities with the issuance of a use permit. A special permit is required because there will be stream crossings and wetland impacts, and so consistent with the county's streamside management area wetland ordinance, uh, a special permit is required for that. The work within those areas is, is primarily limited to road improvements. Um, you'll also be asked to certify the environmental impact report, um, adopt a statement of overriding considerations, and adopt the mitigation and monitoring reporting program. So you don't have any of those resolutions before you tonight. As we mentioned, this isn't a night to take action just to give information. Um, we will prepare those resolutions and have them for you in advance of the next hearing. So the project environmental review process has included uh, scoping, which is required. So this happened in, uh, in 2018. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to go back just one, one minute about the regulatory context um, and talk a little bit about other permits that would be required. So what's not coming before you is a coastal development permit. So the, coastal de the portions of the project are within the coastal zone, and that includes the portions uh, at the fields landing offloading site, and it includes uh, the Hooked in, uh, I, I believe, where we're going to have the, the Hooked in Road detour, um, that is also in the coastal zone. These would be handled by the California Coastal Commission under a consolidated coastal permit. Because there is state jurisdiction and county jurisdiction, there is the option to consolidate these. The applicants have indicated that's what they would prefer to do. So the, the State Coastal Commission will be processing the coastal development permit. It also requires a number of other permits from other agencies. Um, that would be including uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife, Cal Fire encroachment permits, and uh, and other permits from Caltrans. Um, they'll need uh, permits from the North Coast Regional Water uh, Quality Control Board. Um, just quite a variety of other permits required, and they will be processing those. In addition to ministerial permits required by the county, which include uh, grading permits, building permits, uh, as I mentioned, encroachment permits, septic permits, and a well permit. So. All right, so back to scoping. So environmental review process, uh, w this was conducted in 2018. The scoping hearings were, there were two meetings held in August, um, really to just get a sense of uh, the interest in the project and, and what are the issues um, that might come forward to basically inform the preparation of the draft DIR. So at this, during the scoping process, the things that came uh, to the forefront really were visual impacts, uh, potential rate take of at-risk species, effects on cultural resources, including tribal cultural resources, um, noise effects from the wind turbines, and potential traffic congestion concerns and then also environmental effects related to the decommissioning of the project. So with the information gained in scoping, uh, the draft EIR was prepared. Um, this was completed in 2019. And basically, the draft EIR, it evaluated impacts of the project and included avoidance, minimization, and mitigation measures whenever they were found to be feasible. And it does disclose significant unavoidable impacts. And so um, that document was released um, and was circulated for public review starting on April 15, 2019, and originally um, was was due to close on on June 5th, um, which was a 52-day comment period. Um, it was extended for seven days, giving a full 60 days of a comment period. And that brings us to the final EIR. 
which is what we're here to talk about this evening. So this was uh, prepared and, and was ultimately released last Friday, November 1st. Um, it's been available on the county website since then and we've been posting printed copies in several locations. It includes written responses to all of the comments received and we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, it also includes the project, uh, it, project changes proposed by the applicant and, um, and further analysis and refinement of uh, mitigation measures based on all of the comments received and the additional information. So um, we, can, we can discuss that. There is a minimum of 10 days uh, that's required for the, the final EIR to be published before action can be taken. Um, we'll have met that before the hearing next Thursday. Um, but we also want to make sure people understand that there is additional uh, time to comment and we're really hoping that tonight's presentation can just give an overview and help people understand how to use the document, how to um, interpret what's in there and then um, you know, be able to form comments that they may want to bring forth at the next hearing. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the AECOM team who prepared the environmental impact report. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. Yeah. Do pass the keyboard. So uh, my name is Petra Unger. I'm uh, with ACOM. I'm the project director on um, the project and have been involved since its inception. And I would like to um, walk you through, you know, how to read the EIR, what FEIR, what's in there, um, what has changed, what are the highlights. Um, we understand that um, we, we fully are aware of this is a lot of information um, that we digested and prepared and responded to comments to. and. Um, that uh, people would definitely benefit from a kind of an overview. So what to know, um, as Beth mentioned, since circulation of the draft EIR, the project description has been refined in some um, uh, manner here. So we have the realigned shorter Gentai that's more along existing roads and it's uh, three miles shorter than what was studied um, in the um, draft EIR. There's now the overhead crossing of the Eel River that's closer to the point of origin of the energy. Um, the access road and the Gentai alignment um, as revised they actually were uh, studied in the draft EIR under alternative two. So we did look at those corridors um, even in the draft EIR but they were since adopted to be part of the preferred project. Overall the impact area has been reduced and this has been due to some of these realignments but also the micro siting um, of the turbines, dropping some of the turbines, making some of the facilities smaller, like the uh, project substation up on the ridge is now only proposed for two and a half acres instead of five. Um, if you want to know where in the um, FEIR to find a summary of it, it is in the introduction. And uh, there's the map in there that uh, Beth presented earlier, as well as an explanation <coughs> in more detail on each of these uh, refinements. Also, what has changed since the draft EIR is that there has been substantial additional technical information that's uh, been collected and become available, and all of that um, has been included in Appendix B of the final EIR. So there's a series of additional studies and um, um, the additional revegetation plan, refinements, and so on. Um, a lot of detail, all of that has been prepared by the applicant, but peer-reviewed by, peer reviewed by um, the by our team uh, uh, with our specialists and that's uh, all published there for information. Um, and then uh, updated maps uh, where the refined project footprint is um, projected onto the, the project area are included in Appendix C of the EIR. So we refined all the maps that would have changed because there's now a slightly different footprint and we also have a limited number of additional maps uh, that respond to um, some of the requests for data that we received. In terms of the overall structure of the document, as I mentioned, um, chapter one is the introduction and it, it goes over the history of the EIR, <coughs> scope being the structure of the document and it has that important summary of the refinements in circulation. And um, this is fr frequently referred to in the responses to comments. So as you read them, it will often say, you know, this, this has uh, changed since uh, circulation. Please refer to the description here. And there's also, as I mentioned, that map that compares both footprints. Chapter two um, are what we refer to as the master responses. And if you're not familiar with that, a master response is a response to, um, that consolidates information res uh, that, um, to questions that have been provided by many of the commenters. So in, in all the comments and questions we received on the draft EIR, there were, there were very important themes on special topics. And where we had multiple of those, we consolidated the answers into these master responses. And what that does is enables us to really do a deep dive and a more thorough response on that particular topic and look at it from all different angles. 
and so um, to really answer those questions most commonly raised by multiple commenters. So if you really want to know what most of the information in the FEIR is about, I would encourage you to read the master responses. And um, they're basically the core piece of the final EIR. And they're frequently referred to in, in all of the responses to comments. And I'll walk um, you through in a little bit here what they are, and then we'll also do a brief presentation on each of them tonight. So then we come to um, the actual responses to the comments received. This is in, um, starts in chapter three with the response to um, comments received from federal agencies. And we only had a couple there. Um, as Beth mentioned, Humboldt National Wildlife Refuge, there'll be some uh, impacts there on their property and encroachment permit needed. And then also a letter from uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Office. And then chapter four is the responses to comments received <coughs> from state agencies, and we had a total of five here. There's a couple of them from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, a short summary and then a full-length response, as well as Department of Conservation, um, State Lands Commission, who commented on um, the, the undercrossing of the Eel River that was initially proposed that would have required a, a lease from the um, commission. That is no longer uh, the case, the proposed undercrossing, and therefore the lease is no longer required. And then as Beth mentioned, there will be a coastal development permit um, required, so the California Coastal Commission also uh, provided detailed comments on the um, draft EIR. So if you want to know um, or see in detail what any of those commenters said, um, all of the comment letters are produced in their full length in Appendix A of the final EIR, and all of those comment letters have been coded um, by specific comments they have. And so, um, you know, if you want to look at the federal responses, they will be comment as, uh, you know, F comments, meaning F1 is the first uh, comment in the uh, first letter here, and, and so on, so you can have a crosswalk. But, um, but for um, clarity and to make reading of the document e uh, easier, we have also uh, included a brief summary of that particular comment as at the beginning of each response. Chapter five is a response to comments from regional and local agencies, um, such as the cities, PG&E, um, town of Scotia, and so on. Um, chapter six is um, responses to comments received from tribes, and we had two letters there. And then chapter seven is, is a very large chapter, <laughs> um, and it uh, includes responses to comments uh, from organizations that were submitted. Um, there were a total number of 16 organizations um, that you see listed here that submitted detailed comment letters. Um, some of them had uh, several commenters or, or contractors they hired or um, included you know, specific comment letters. These go into a lot of detail on anything from wildlife to concerns on water quality to concerns about um, local property and, and so on. Some of these are hundreds of pages long and include hundreds of pages of additional um, uh, documents submitted, so uh, there's quite a volume of these, and again, they're all included in that Appendix A, and then the, the summaries are all summarized, uh, the comments are each summarized at the beginning of the response. Chapter 8 is individual um, responses to comments, so we received 244 individual um, uh, individuals that commented on, on the um, draft EIR. So they are all included there, and then we also received 109 uh, identical comment letters that um, are included in Chapter 8b. So uh, because they're all identical, um, they're all reproduced in Appendix A. However, there's one response to all of them, as they're all identical. Then Chapter 9 is a very important chapter that summarizes the revisions to the draft EIR. And so it's important to understand how these revisions came about. There's, there's various reasons on why they came about. One of them is that uh, the updated technical information, the studies that were available. So having um, those available, uh, you know, of course, uh, updated the list of studies relied upon. In some cases, it refined some of the, um, you know, results of the surveys. Uh, it provided additional information on, on some of the resources and so on. So an important part to support the analysis. Um, the refined project description. It's in Chapter 9. Um, like I mentioned, it was summarized in one, but um, Chapter 9 includes the entire project description. And uh, all throughout Chapter 9, you can see the changes um, to the draft EIR in underlining and strikeout, meaning strikeout is information that has been struck from the document. Underlining is new information. 
And so this shows the entire project description in context, so you can go through and really see what has changed. Um, some of it has also, uh, the in the document, has also changed in response to uh, the comments and the comments letters we received, uh, where people maybe said, uh, this is confusing or misleading, or there's not enough information here, or um, can you please clarify um, that also um, resulted in some changes to the language in the document. And then there were some minor errata, meaning where we came across some miscited references or maybe some uh, some uh, numbers that were slightly off. Um, all of those were incorporated into that chapter nine. And because uh, that, of course, then pulls little segments from the entire FEIR into one chapter and it can be confusing to read, for ease of reading, um, we included two chapters from the draft EIR in, in their entirety. One of them is that updated project description, so you can really see line by line or uh, subsection by subsection what has changed. The other one is the uh, biological resources impact section. So um, a lot of the volume of the draft EIR is uh, related to impacts on biological resources. Um, that was the case in the draft EIR. It continues to be in the final EIR. And so to not make the reader hunt for what has changed or how um, you know, mitigation has been refined or what specific wording was added, we um, decided to produce that section as in its entirety there, which makes that chapter nine quite long, um, but we do hope it understands, um, it helps understand the, the changes there. What is very important to understand is with, with all of this and all these changes or additional revisions that uh, none of the impact conclusions from the uh, draft EIR were changed. Um, this is refined, but the impact conclusions were all um, uh, corroborated by the additional information provided, and so it is all consistent with what was presented. And then chapters 10 and 11 are the references, uh, references for the new, um, uh, for basically for the FEIR, and then uh, chapter 11 is all the preparers. So in summary, here's uh, you know, what we received in terms of comments uh, by which group of commenters. And we had a total of 384 comments that were responded to in detail in this final document. And uh, it was uh, quite a, quite a um, extensive <laughs> analysis and, and it was a heavy lift by a lot of people with a lot of uh, deep expertise in, in the topics here. And um, you will see that, see that reflected in some of the master responses that we will be stepping through here. So I'll cover the first two and then I'll turn it over to some of my colleagues to um, uh, cover uh, the other master responses. Uh, master response one is uh, on site planning and avoidance measures. Throughout the uh, comment letters, we had a lot of questions about why here, why the, why, why the project that we have and why is it located where it is, why does it look the way we is, it is. So um, th this master response um, describes in detail the uh, site screening that you know was gone stepped through by the applicant to see how they arrived on on the site and and why it is the size it is so the original site screening was driven by wind availability looked at various ridges access to lands interconnection options um, originally there were multiple um, ridges throughout the area studied for potential placement of wind turbines but some of them were eliminated in that early um, phase due to access or resource constraints and then we had the project that was analyzed in the draft EIR and described in the original application for um, conditional use permit. And as Beth mentioned, that used a, co a corridor approach with placing turbines on Bear River and Monument Ridges and um, studied a 100 foot wide corridor for the, the turbine locations and then 200 feet around access lines, collect collection lines, and so on. And that was done with um, the understanding that we it would allow for uh, later refinements to you know avoid impacts and uh, maybe refine some of those and then we have the further refinements uh, after the draft EIR was um, circulated and that was based as I mentioned on that additional resource information and uh, service that have become available uh, the micro siting, meaning putting the turbines uh, more in places where we know they avoid uh, resources to the degree feasible. Um, it was also done in response to comments. In some cases, we had concerns about noise to certain neighbors. So uh, one of the turbine was eliminated based on noise concern to the um, nearest closest receptor. Um, a lot of them were um, concerns about northern spotted owl and marbled murrelet. So um, the 
microsiding added additional buffer areas and stayed away from that. Um, the Eel River directional drilling was eliminated to address water quality and fisheries concerns and so on. So in essence, there were further refinement, uh, refinements to avoid impacts. And it is all described in, in great detail in Master Response 1. Oop. All right, stop, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna cover Master Response 7 here, a little out of uh, order, but that's kind of more my area of expertise. So in, um, we had a lot of um, questions about special status plans and sensi sensitive natural communities analysis presented in the biological resources section. Um, questions for clarification on the survey area and why certain um, areas were unsurveyed at the time that the um, draft EIR was published. So um, this describes the corridor approach that was taken in 2018 and uh, there were some uh, unsurveyed areas because of safety concerns, a small amount, and then also because of access, because of the site of th at the time that the 2018 special status plan surveys were conducted, access to those sites had not been gained yet. Um, the refined project area in 2019 has been studied in its entirety, including the eastern portion of the Gentai that hadn't been previously studied due to access concerns, as well as improvement at fields landing along those transportation improvements areas. So we now have full um, survey coverage and we have, uh, a as a result of those 2019 surveys, there were some additional occurrences of special status plans documented in the corridor. Um, there were questions regarding mitigation and performance standard. Um, the draft EIR call called for the preparation of a reclamation, revegetation, and weed control plan, but it stopped short of, of having um, all of the detail in that plan in there. So, um, and, and there were questions on whether this would, um, you know, maybe um, amount to deferral of mitigation. Um, the re reclamation and revegetation weed control plan has now been prepared and it is included in Appendix B um, of the final EIR and includes all those performance standards um, and, and gives a lot more detail on uh, what will be required for revegetation. Um, there were comments regarding to impacts on sensitive natural communities, specifically forest communities such as Douglas fir forest or redwoods. Um, the draft ER states that tree removal under the forest practice rules or under a approved timber harvest plan does not require mitigation for such forest types. Um, and uh, so that, that, that is true, remains true in the FEIR. Um, but some refinements of uh, the project description have since uh, eliminated, uh, completely el eliminated impacts on any grand fir forest. Um, and the acreages for Douglas fir and redwood forest have been refined. And while we still don't call for uh, mitigation for those forest types under sensitive natural communities, it is important to note that under um, permanent, uh, there will <coughs> be permanent protection of forest types as part of the northern spotted owl mitigation. So um, those permanent impacts not mitigated under sensitive natural communities would be 262 acres but the um, mitigation for northern spotted owl habitat calls for permanent protection and conservation of 266 acres. And then um, there were some uh, questions on temporary and permanent impacts and how they were, um, how they were characterized in the draft EIR specifically related to um, native grasslands and whether those, uh, what we consider temporary should be permanent. Um, Again, those acreages have been refined and, and in a lot of cases downsized in the uh, draft EIR. Um, however, we still consider um, areas that are revegetated um, within that 18 months construction period or right after as temporary impacts for those glassland communities. And then um, the details and performance standard for that have been included in Appendix uh, B. So again, none of this changed the conclusions reached by the draft EIR. And with that, I'll turn it over to Susan for wildlife impacts. Good evening. My name is Susan Sanders. I am a wildlife biologist with AECOM, and I oversaw preparation of the biological resources section of the draft and final EIR. And I'm going to walk through some of the wildlife master responses. You can, hold can you hear me better now? I, I'm going to be going through the wildlife master responses, starting with marbled merlets. So a lot of commenters wanted a second year of data on the uh, marbled merlet 
radar survey data, and that was done. A second year of data was collected between October 2018 and September 2019, and the report for that can be read in Appendix B of the FEIR. The uh, results of the second year were very similar to year one in terms of uh, mer merlet activity, seasonal abundance, and flight patterns. The combined data 2018-2019 allowed refinements of the turbines and, in fact, elimination of some turbines. The five turbines that were of the nearest to high passage rates for marbled merlets were removed, and then an additional eight turbines were removed. Comments and down to 47 turbines, which you heard from Beth, from 60 to, to 47. The um, commenters also requested a revised marbled merlet collision risk assessment based on two years of data, and that was done. That study is also available in Appendix B of the FEIR. That revised collision risk model estimated there would be 7.7 marbled merlet fatalities as a result of collisions with wind turbines over the 30-year life of the project, and that's down from 10.86 marbled merlets. That's reflecting the reduction in the number of turbines um, for the most part. The Is that better? Is that better? Can people hear better now? Okay. So the second year of radar study, the second year of the, the second uh, revised collision risk assessment based on the two years of data didn't change the conclusions of significance. It basically corroborated and substantiated the results that were shown in the, uh, the draft EIR. Am I still good on sound? Everybody hearing okay? Okay. Commenters also wanted more details on the marbled merlet mitigation that was proposed. It was described in the draft EIR, but more detail was requested. Appendix B now includes a detailed mitigation strategy for marbled merlets. The proposed mitigation approach doesn't involve uh, securing land or trying to enhance old growth habitat. You can't really make, create 200 year old habitat Instead, it focuses on increasing reproductive success of exist in existing habitat. And the approach th that's proposed in the mitigation strategy, in both the DEIR and in the FER, but in more detail, is to reduce corvid predation. Stellar's jays, common ravens, eat marbled merlet nestlings. And the reason there's more corvids is because there's um, human food supplies for them either trash or food left behind. So the mitigation approach is going to be to minimize the subsidies for those corvid predators in Van Dusen County Park, which will also have benefits to the adjacent Cheatham Grove um, marbled merlet habitat nearby. And with this, if you achieve the target described in the mitigation strategy, a 50% reduction in corvid abundance and predation, you should be achieving somewhere between 50 and 100 additional marble merlets that achieve reproductive age over the 30-year life of the project, which more than compensates for the loss of 7.7 .7 birds. We have not changed the significance conclusion. In the draft EIR, we said this impact was significant, unavoidable. The reason we haven't changed it is because 7.7 .7 is still a lot of marbled merlets for a rare species. We have confidence in the mitigation strategy. It's evidence-based, but it is a model. So in an abundance of caution, we are leaving the significance conclusion as it was written in the draft EIR. Commenters also wanted a second year of northern spotted owl surveys. And that's been done. Spotted owl surveys were conducted uh, in 2019 using the 2012 Fish and Wildlife Service protocol for surveying proposed management activities that may impact northern spotted owls. And the goal was to determine occupancy of spotted owls within the survey area. There is a wealth of information about spotted owls in the project area because HRC, Humboldt Redwood Company, has been collecting data for a long time. 
adjacent landowners have also been collecting that kind of data because they're required to do so. And there's also information from CDFW's database. With that information, uh, well, the surveys found 23 spotted owl detections attributed to 12 activity centers, and five of those are within 0.25 miles of the project area. So with this information, we, um, the applicant was able to reduce impacts on spotted owl habitat by some 26%. And I have a feeling you can't see this very well, but I mean, what I want to show you is red represents the final environmental impact alignment of the Gentai, and the yellow is the draft EIR. And as Beth talked about, things were rearranged to minimize impacts on spotted owl activity centers. This is the western portion of the project area. Here's the eastern portion, and let me, I'm hoping you're seeing, I'm sorry for the graphics. I think this is gonna be a consistent theme, apologizing for the graphics. All these exhibits are in the final environmental impact report, but I know it's hard to see on this screen. What you should see here is a little green circle that represents a thousand foot buffer around a spotted owl activity center. That's to protect the birds from auditory visual impacts during construction. All of the activity centers will be avoided except for one and that's Goat Rock, which I have the cursor on. Yeah, right there. That one is uh, within the thousand foot buffer and to accommodate that, no construction will occur within the, um, the thousand foot buffer during the breeding season. And the closest any construction will occur will be 800 feet. Commenters requested more information and clarity as to what constituted a temporary versus a permanent impact. It was discussed in the draft EIR. We provided more detail, and this table has been refined. A permanent impact represents something occupied by a turbine pad, a road, and we considered the gentai to be permanent. Not that there'll be no vegetation there. It'll be shrubs and early several stage but from pur for purposes of a spotted owl, it no longer provides nesting or roosting habitat. It, it could provide some foraging habitat, it could produce some spotted owl prey items, but it no longer will supply the kinds of habitat values it once did. So the total, Im and then we also, uh, commenters wanted more information about the fragmentation impacts, the fact that you're cutting through northern spotted owl habitat, and then you're affecting the adjacent habitat. We analyzed that impact and assessed it would extend about 100 feet, about a tree's height, into the forest from the border of the Gentai into the forest. And it would, it would diminish the value of foraging and roosting habitat because it would affect the microclimate, you've no longer got the buffering effect of the trees, so you would have wind and sun coming in where it didn't before, and you would have predators like great horned owls coming in. And so that was quantified in the final environmental impact report. Commenters also requested more details about the mitigation for northern spotted owl habitat loss. It's not operational loss. We don't anticipate operational impacts on northern spotted owls. So we're proposing mitigation at a one-to-one -one ratio for impacts on foraging, roosting, and nesting habitat. The reason that one-to-one -one will offset the impacts of the project is because the proposed mitigation land is of very high quality. It's currently vulnerable to logging. And so the applicant proposes to put these under conservation easements. The uh, Appendix B of the final environmental impact report has details on exactly what's offered by these potential mitigation lands, which are feasible to acquire conservation easements the applicant has done sufficient investigation to demonstrate that it is feasible to secure these. So this is just a summary of the habitat that's available within these mitigation sites. Another advantage to these mitigation sites is there's also habitat for off-site compensatory mitigation for some of the sensitive plant communities that Petra talked about earlier. 
In addition, the applicant proposes to implement uh, Bardell management as an adjunct, perhaps, to this uh, acquisition or conservation easements to be secured. And that would really enhance the value of the mitigation because barred owls are a significant threat, one of the most significant threats to northern spotted owls. All right. Um, commenters wanted a second year of data on eagle use count surveys and nesting surveys, and that was done. The surveys were conducted in accordance with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Eagle Conservation Plan guidance, Fish and Wildlife Service 2013. The count surveys did not detect as many, um, I don't think they detected any eagles in year two, they did in year one. Eagle nest surveys uh, were um, conducted aerially per Fish and Wildlife Service guidance within 10 miles of the project area. And then in 2019, ground-based surveys to follow up on historical nests were conducted within two miles of the project area. They did find two golden eagle nests that were active in the 2019 surveys. None of them were successful in producing young. They were within about two miles of the nearest turbines. So, um, I know you can't see this all that well, but you will see, I hope, yellow triangles representing nests, and then here's the, here are the location of the turbines. And this is available in Appendix B in the Eagle Survey, Nest Survey Report. There were questions about how we estimated the number of, of raptor fatalities, uh, which was based on studies from other wind energy projects. There isn't there is not any other wind energy project in this area, so we don't have, it's not like the Altamont or Solana wind resource area where there's ample data from adjacent post-construction monitoring. And some commenters said that we overestimated the extent of fatalities. We took the conservative approach of assuming that the worst case scenario would prevail and there'd be as many as 114 raptor fatalities per year. With additional information supplied by the commenter, we, we did reassess that impact and concluded that perhaps there was an overestimate and that it's more likely to be somewhere between four to, four to 30. And we were conservative and assumed it would be as much as 50. We still consider that a significant and unavoidable impact because that still is a lot of raptors. Mitigation for Eagle fatalities will be, for every take of an eagle, retrofits of high-risk power poles will be implemented. Eagles are at, um, a lot of eagles are lost to electrocution, and the Fish and Wildlife Service advocates this approach for mitigation, is you, you improve these old, these old um, power poles that have electrified components within the wingspan of an eagle, so upgrading those reduces the risk of electrocution for eagles and offsets the loss from, the, from collision risk, from collision um, fatalities. So again, the, the significant conclusion is unchanged, um, but we have made perhaps a better, more realistic estimate of what the fatalities are likely to be. We got a lot of comments on bats. And we got a lot of excellent suggestions from commenters on how to improve the bat um, mitigation measures. We concluded on this that there would be significant impacts, but that they could be reduced to less than significant with mitigation. A particular focus was hoary bats, which are not a listed species, but they're one of concern because there are recent studies indicating that wind energy in particular could be responsible for substantial declines over the next 50 years, even to the point of extirpation in places. So it was something we took very seriously and we proposed as mitigation. And because there's so many uncertainties about that population demographics and dynamics, the effects of wind energy and mitigation, that what we proposed was a BAT technical advisory committee to take advantage of the most recent science, have experts advise the county on how best to implement mitigation. 
What commenters want in a, a lot more detail about the structure, the roles, the composition, responsibilities, qualifications of the Technical Advisory Committee, and they had suggestions on how to make it better, which we've added to mitigation measure 3.5-18A. Uh, you can see the revised measure in Chapter 9 of the FEIR. Commenters also wanted more information about how exactly are you going to implement these measures? What are the measures in detail that are going to be helping us avoid and minimize impacts? So uh, we have provided the stepwise approach to implementing acoustic deterrence first, which is a promising avenue for discouraging bats from coming close to turbines. And if that doesn't work, operational mitigation of curtailment will be implemented. This will be done during low wind nights, which is the highest risk to bats during fall migration, just a couple of months. So it's a limited period. It results in relatively little loss of energy generation because it is a low wind night, but it reduces bat impacts by 50 to 80 percent. Very effective. So we've provided more detail on exactly how avoidance and minimization will be implemented and the steps that will be taken to achieve that. In addition, the applicant's going to be implementing feathering of turbines, which allows um, the cut in speed to, um, excuse me. Yeah, so um, that way, the cut in speed, which is the speed at which the turbines actually start rotating, will be the blades are turned kind of parallel to the direction of the wind and it slows the rotation to one to two revolutions per minute, which substantially reduces the risk to bats. So we've supplied the detail that was requested and incorporated many of the suggestions from commenters. This hasn't changed our conclusion. We still, we still believe this is a s uh, significant impact, but one that can be minimized to less than significant. We've basically supplied the additional detail requested by commenters and um, I think improve the mitigation, but it hasn't changed the conclusions from the draft EIR. And finally, the last wildlife uh, topic I'm going to cover is impacts on resident and migratory birds. Based on studies from, from 21 other post mortality construction monitoring projects throughout the North America, we've estimated something like three to six avian mortalities per turbine per year, and that amounts to on the order of 150 to 300 birds per year. Most of those will be the resident passerine or perching birds, like western meadowlarks, blackbirds. Um, there will be, and these are, um, these are ones that breed and reside most of the year at the project site. Migratory birds are less likely to be, um, ones that are just passing through a migration, less likely to be affected. Those typically fly higher than the level of the turbines, often above 1,000 feet. There were concerns expressed by commenters about why have you put a um, wind project in an important bird area. There's the Cape Mendocino grasslands important bird area. The area that is affect th that the project affects in the Cape Mendocino important bird area is very small. Permanent impacts are less than 0.01% and temporary impacts are um, just 0.05%. The impacts on resident birds, it does not, even though it sounds like a lot, 150 to 300 avian mortalities per year, the reason it doesn't achieve a level of significance from a CEQA standard is these are common widespread birds and we're not going to be causing a population decline with these kinds of impacts. So that's all I have on wildlife. I'm going to turn things over to um, Ken Cook now. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. I am Ken Cook, SQL project manager for AECOM on this project. I'm going to um, keep things brief. I know we have a lot of uh, people waiting to comment on uh, the document and the project, so here we go. 
Uh, a number of comments were received regarding the uh, how the, the HCP for uh, Humboldt Redwood Company relates to the project. And the short answer is it doesn't. The, uh, the project applicant is not uh, a permittee under the, under the HCP, and uh, the project itself is not a covered activity. And covered activities are timber management, mining, and road construction. However, CEQA requires the, uh, the county to consider uh, whether or not a project would conflict with the uh, plan or program adopted for uh, avoidance or reduction of environmental effects and also specifically asks if a project would conflict with an HCP, adopted HCP. So the EIR does consider those, uh, th consider the HCP and the project in that context and finds that the project itself would not uh, conflict or preclude the ability of HRC to uh, comply with the HCP. And the reasons for that are listed above. Uh, the project has a refined footprint that avoids or lessens uh, effects where feasible. Uh, the f there are mitigation measures that have uh, been applied when a significant impact was identified. And the project is also subject to uh, regulatory permit conditions, which further reduce effects. Um, the, the, there's much more detail in the uh, EIR that runs through each specific management objective of the HCP. So I would encourage you to make sure you look at that. Uh, mass response nine, there was also a number of comments related to uh, the analysis of greenhouse gas specifically questioning the methods used in the modeling approach that was taken. Um, one of, the, one of the, the primary questions came up was regarding the uh, ability of the, the land that, or the, the forest to, uh, to capture carbon. Uh, and the, the, the assertion was that the reduction in forest land would actually result in uh, an the project having a negative effect on uh, greenhouse gas, in other words, would result in more greenhouse gas than under current conditions. Um, we used Cal EMOD model, which is adopted by uh, the air districts and prepared by, or was developed by CAPCOA, the uh, Air Pollution Control Officers um, Association, specifically to evaluate uh, air, regional air emissions from land development projects uh, and, is, and is recognized as the model for use in CEQA documents. Uh, we conducted a modeling effort using that uh, second run to, uh, to subtract uh, the, 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 uh, the storage loss of carbon from the build out of the project. And the findings were uh, that the project remains a, a beneficial effect, beneficial impact and the conclusions of the document are unchanged. Uh, this project is consistent with state uh, policy for meeting climate change goals and, and reducing uh, power uh, generation from fossil fuels. And uh, CEQA specifically allows a lead agency to consider consistency with the state policy when making impact determinations. Now, wildfire, this is obviously a big issue these days. A um, number of comments were raised trying to equate the project setting and uh, transmission system with uh, PG&E's uh, equipment and, and that was responsible for the campfire. Uh, and this is incorrect for several reasons. Um, to address this issue, uh, the topical response expanded upon the setting uh, which is a key factor when you're evaluating or making a determination of impact um, potential. What is uh, an impact in an urban setting may not be so in a rural and vice versa. So you, it's a key factor when you're evaluating a project. Um, in this case, the project's proposed on managed landscape, which is uh, actively, uh, there is an active effort to uh, remove undergrowth that can fuel a fire. Uh, there is also trained uh, labor that is out on the site regularly that has equipment and uh, communications gear 
and is trained to specifically res uh, observe and report wildfires out on the site. I mean, it's important for HRC to, um, I mean, their capital is all tied up in the, in the timber, so it's important for them to maintain uh, control and, and not allow a wildfire. Uh, they also provide uh, aerial surveillance uh, during the summer fire season. And all those are part of the baseline or existing setting. We also identified, oh, I would just add that the project itself is designed with s systems that would, uh, would allow the operators to uh, monitor the operations of individual turbines and the system itself and can shut them off remotely. So if there is an issue, uh, that there could be overheating or there's a spark or there's just, uh, you know, a turbine's turbine too, turning too flat, fast, um, there's the ability to control. Whereas in PG&E system, it's 100 years old, and uh, a lot of times they do not have the system in place, um, as in the case with the line that was uh, responsible for the campfire. Finally, we uh, expanded our existing mitigation measure uh, to incorporate some of the activities and requirements that the CPUC uh, applied when they uh, adopted the uh, wildfire planning efforts that all utilities have to uh, prepare. And the result is the, the conclusion is unchanged from the draft EIR. There is, uh, the project does have a potential for a significant effect, but this effect can be mitigated to less than significant levels with adoption of the mitigation. alternatives. Um, <laughs> the draft EIR provides a, a reasonable range of alternatives that uh, feasibly meet the project objectives uh, and avoid or lessen significant effects of the project. And the, the county followed, uh, uh, there followed the CEQA guidelines for establishing a reasonable range, which is you just have to have sufficient a number of alternatives so that there's an informed decision making. You don't need to have every single possible alternative listed in the document. Um, so a, a number of comments were received on off-site. Why, why this site? Why not another site elsewhere in the state? And that's uh, addressed sort of in site uh, in Master Response 1 that Petra discussed earlier. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into detail, but here's some of the, the factors that were used in identifying the feasibility of offsite alternatives, and they're listed here. It's uh, meteorological data. Is there sufficient wind to support development of a wind energy project? Uh, the ability to uh, transport large, heavy components to a site. Uh, capacity of the transmission grid to accept the energy. That's a big issue uh, in our system ability for the applicant to control or gain ownership of the property, and last but not least, ability to meet uh, project objectives, the, the primary objectives of the project. Uh, based on those factors uh, and considering the types of environmental effects in the, uh, that were identified for the, draft, for the project in the draft EIR, uh, we have a series of, of alternative designs that were selected for review. Uh, the first is a no project, that's standard CEQA requirement that would maintain current conditions. Uh, there would not be a renewable energy project developed at this location, but based on the fact that we have state, uh, pro state law that, uh, and programs that require increased renewable energy uh, to supply the state in the future, it is likely there will be a renewable energy uh, development elsewhere developed with impacts Realignment of the Gentai. This would uh, shrink the length of the Gentai and also removes the underground component and places it within the profile of the Stafford Bridge. Uh, so that would have benefits for reducing uh, the potential for water quality effects and uh, reduce the footprint of disturbance footprint. Uh, the Monument Ridge alternative. I have to use my cheat sheet now. Uh, sorry. Wait, now I don't. 
don't see it. Anyways, um, Monument Ridge avoidance would reduce the turbine count and uh, eliminate turbines from Monument Ridge. This would increase the uh, spacing between turbines uh, and reduces the, the footprint, the, the disturbance footprint on the ground. There is also a reduced turbine count, which would uh, reduce the number of turbines uh, compared to the project, but would spread them out within the same uh, steady corridor. So this would allow for greater spacing between the turbine blades, but would not reduce the disturbance footprint in terms of the corridor. And alternative five is a Bear River Ridge avoidance alternative. And this would, again, reduce the number of turbines and removes de turbine development from Bear River Ridge, which would uh, avoid impacts to tribal cultural resources and visual effects. And as noted, in the presentation from Beth and Petra, the, the applicant subsequent to release of the draft EIR uh, submitted a revised project that in actually incorporates several components from the alternatives analysis. So from my perspective, the CEQA process is working and you're getting a project that is uh, the result of a combined effort of many thousands of staff hours um, addressing and analyz anal analyzing the effects of the project, consistent with CEQA's requirements. Thank you. I'll turn it over to uh, Beth. Thanks, Ken. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the significant unavoidable effects of the project. Um, we've heard about a couple of them already as we went through the wildlife discussion. So those that we've heard about are the operational impacts to marbled murelets, which we found to be significant unavoidable. Um, and also operational impacts to raptors. Um, and uh, we did have considerable, as was discussed, you know, changes and enhancements and refinements uh, to uh, improve the mitigation measures and make them more clear. However, we still landed on the same conclusion that they were significant and unavoidable. There's also a couple others that didn't make their way into the master responses, but I want to make sure that we cover them here. So the first is an air quality impact. And uh, I just want to be clear that the project will not have a long-term effect on air quality. Um, but we did find based on the modeling that due to the uh, heavy equipment that will be operating and the quantity of it, that there will be during construction and for a short duration, uh, daily exceedances of the threshold of NOx, which is oxides of nitrogen. Um, so again, this is just a daily level. The actual amount, the threshold they set annually will not be exceeded, but it is an exceedance. And so therefore we conservatively called it a significant unavoidable impact. Um, the others that are um, a little bit more um, substantial to discuss are um, visual and tribal cultural. We're, we have one small historic impact we'll also discuss, but I think we're going to launch into visual first. So as Susan said, we'll be apologizing for some of these graphics. This is uh, the image with a photo uh, visual simulation from Riverwalk Drive in Fortuna. So standing right there at the conference center, essentially. And uh, you can't see them very well here. These are printed. These exact same images are in the draft EIR, and they're available online. And they're much easier to see that there are, in fact, um, you know, a visual impact of turbines along, uh, along the ridge here. This is the image from Rio Dell. From Rio Dell, the nearest turbine would be approximately 5.3 miles away. And again, difficult to see, but it, um, I think it's a little easier actually on this board for some reason, the lighting. But um, all along the ridge, uh, basically from the view from Rio Dell, you would, you would see the turbines. Excuse me. Would it be possible to um, maybe refer to the pages um, that are in the FEIR. Yeah, thanks. And these are in the draft EIR. Yeah. So if you've got the uh, draft EIR um, and go to uh, basically pages 3.2 34, there are a series of uh, images that follow that. 
so in in the draft DIRs, you see those. There's quite a few images reproduced. You see, you'll see images of the view as it exists now, um, kind of an image showing where that location is in relationship to other places, and then also a blown up version, an 11 by 17 version of, of just what I'm showing on the screen now, so that it is more visible. Um, and so this was uh, prepared by the applicant in their um, in their uh, aesthetics and visual analysis. So this is from Main Street, Scotia. And again, it, it seems clearer on, on, on the screen that your commission is looking at. Um, from Scotia, the nearest turbine is estimated to be 4.2 miles away. Um, and it would you know, dominate the skyline um, from Scotia. So this is definitely a significant unavoidable impact. There's really no way around it. We've looked at feasible mitigation in terms of um, you know, requiring them to be non-reflective and off-white or gray in color. Um, they, they will also have lighting at night because there is FAA requirements. We don't know exactly what that will look like yet. It may be um, a blinking light, red or white. It may be a steady light. Um, they may be on constantly or, or not. But, um, um, the FAA will determine that, and, and um, so for this purpose, you know, we kind of assume the worst that they will all be lit. That may not be the case. It may only be certain select turbines that end up with night lighting uh, or with, with the FAA lights, but um, either way, if, even if there was just one, it's a significant unavoidable impact. It's a, it's a big change from what's out there now, and we acknowledge that, um, and so, you know, there's, we just need to disclose and, uh, that it is significant and unavoidable. So in, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about historic, cultural, and, and there's a, quite a few components to this, so I want to be really clear on, on the impacts we're having. There is a landscape out of near the turbine location, primarily in the Russ uh, Ranch area on Bear, on Bear River Ridge, that is a, uh, called the Bear River Ridge and Valley Historical Landscape. And this is a landscape that's assumed to be eligible for the California Reg Register of Historic Resources. Uh, and there will be uh, access roads and turbines within this area. It's, it's, it is a landscape, it's not a direct point. We're not going to be affecting any of the resources in there. There's a barn, for example, we're, we're not impacting that barn, but just the fact that turbines are out there and they're not part of that historic landscape, um, that is an impact. And there is one mitigation measure proposed that requires an American Landscape Survey report to be prepared. And this would fully document the landscape and give us a lot more information about what's going on out there However, that doesn't mitigate the fact that we'll be changing it. So that remains significant and unavoidable, and we have not, there's no feasible mitigation for that, so that we've found. So, so again, that's, that's that we want to be clear about disclosing. Um, there are effects to, uh, there, there are uh, potential impacts, rather, to archaeological resources. There's about, I think, approximately 26 of them within the project area. Um, they will all be avoided, and that's the archaeological resources, so stuff, stuff that's in the ground. Um, those will be avoided um, either by complete you know, rerouting and, and, and going around them, or by capping, which is consistent with what the measures call for in the general plan. So those mitigations are, are in place. And again, for the archaeological resources specifically related to, to cultural, um, we will not be having a significant unavoidable impact. That is mitigated to less than significant. Where we come into the significant unavoidable impacts are related to tribal cultural resources. And these ones are, are pretty big. So we have Bear River Ridge, um, which has been, uh, through consultation, we've learned with the Wiat tribe that Bear River Ridge is a sacred high place and a, point, a, a spot of prayer for the Wiat tribe. You can also, from Bear River Ridge, see the entirety of Wiat territory, by and large. And so it's a very special place. Um, and, and putting these turbines on that ridge is a significant unavoidable impact to that tribal cultural resource. And it's not something we can mitigate. If the turbines go there, the impact will be there. So we are fully disclosing that that, that is the case. Um, likewise, there is um, a, a, a ethnobotanical area along the ridge that uh, the Wiat tribe has, uh, you know, there's evidence there that they've been uh, uh, managing that area for, for a very, very long time, many hundreds of years. And so um, that, that will experience impacts 
Um, we do have mitigation for those impacts to the ethnobotanical area. It includes incorporating uh, the Wiat tribe's list of culturally significant plants into the revegetation plan and the reclamation plan that's going to happen. Um, it also involves salvaging plants that are on that list and providing them to the Wiat tribe. Um, but even with those mitigations, we find that that impact is still significant and unavoidable. Um, there's also the condor. So condors right now don't fly around. We don't have them locally. They, they were once here and um, they are soon to be re-released um, through a program that uh, the uh, National Park Service and the Uruk, Uruk tribe are engaged in. And so when that happens, which is reasonably foreseeable, um, certainly during the life of this project, uh, the, the condor range, they'll be released in the Bald Hills area and their range will include Bear River Ridge and Monument Ridge. They condors have a very wide range. Um, condors are a very sacred bird to all the tribes locally, um, and, and we learned that during consultation, and so we consider any impact to the condor to be significant. Now, we have some great mitigation for condors. Um, through the program where they're being released, they, they, uh, it's called an experimental population, and they monitor them very closely, and they all wear these little transponders, um, like little backpacks, and uh, the, the project can have a geofence um, that essentially alerts um, the control system when a condor comes near a turbine or, or you know some distance, and uh, make sure that those turbines are, are off so that there's not injury to the condor. Um, this has been implemented uh, in, uh, in I think, uh, down south where there's more turbines and condor there is a condor flock, and so far there has not been any condor strike. So it's, it's proved to be highly effective. Um, originally, the mitigation measure we had proposed for this allowed for a six-month implementation window. So basically, after the condor program became live, there was going to be six months before they'd have to figure out how to get the geofence. Um, Based on comments we heard, uh, we've changed that. So that geofence will be live basically when the project goes operational and to be ready for the condors whenever they're released. Um, so we, we consider that to be a very, very low risk to condors. Um, however, because it is such a sacred bird with so much importance, uh, we, we still just conservatively landed on a significant unavoidable impact. So those are the tribal cultural resources that, that um, we've landed in significant unavoidable. So that mostly concludes the presentation. I did want to just point out that you received a staff report for tonight's meeting. Um, and within the staff report, it's, it's primarily the executive summary. So it, it highlights a lot of the points that we've discussed this evening and goes through in detail the findings, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the um, the, the basic concepts and, and the impacts. There's also within your staff report attachment A, which is just a, a list of all the impacts um, that have been analyzed in the draft DIR and, and refined. So you'll see you know, which ones are not discussed further, which one did not require mitigation, which ones have been mitigated to a level that's less than significant, and just as we've discussed, those that are significant and unavoidable. Um, also, within your uh, staff report, you received an attachment that was public comments. Those were public comments that were received after the official close of the public comment period for the draft DIR. Um, we still received some. We did accept a couple that maybe trickled in a couple days after the close of the period, but at some point we needed to you know, get writing. And so um, the others um, that came in after the date uh, are, are compiled here, and I believe you have a supplemental that does the same. And so we'll keep bringing those to your commission every meeting. We have um, until we reach a decision so that you're informed of all the comments we're receiving on the project. But just to know that these did not come in during the time frame that would have required official response to comments during the DEIR circulation. So with that, um, that really concludes staff's presentation. Um, and Chair Morris, if, if you agree, I'll help the applicant there get their presentation up. Yes, I think that we'll listen to the applicant and then we'll, we'll take a, a break and following that we'll have questions from the commission for the uh, applicant and or the staff. Uh, so if the applicant would get ready, uh, we can, uh, you can have your presentation. And, but, but before we do, I'd like to make a, a disclosure that uh, several months ago, I did have uh, some communication with the applicant in which they gave me a, a, a brief overview of the project. I've not talked to them since, and that's uh, been uh, my communication with them. So, applicant. Good evening, uh, Commission staff, uh, Chairman, Plenty, and Commission members, um, and 
thank you for your consideration of, of this application. I also want to uh, thank the public, those watching online, those that are here in person. Um, uh, the nice part about this process is that it affords everybody an opportunity to speak. Um, in the spirit of disclosures, uh, Chairman Morris, um, I have uh, had various contact with all members of the Planning Commission, some in person, some by phone, um, and so I just want to be clear about that. Um, so we, uh, we thank you for your time today. So my, my name is Nathan Vitus. Um, thank you. Yes, the up and down there. Great. Okay. So my, my name is Nathan Vitus. I'm the uh, project applicant. Uh, my title is I'm Senior Director of Wind Development for Terrigen. Uh, Terrigen and the, this uh, associated Humboldt project, the wind project, uh, Terrigen is the, the applicant. Uh, the project name is the Humboldt Wind Project. It's uh, under the application name of Humboldt Wind LLC. Um, so what we're here today to talk about is a wind energy project that would produce zero emissions for approximately 70,000 households in Humboldt County and beyond. This is an opportunity for Humboldt County to do something real and tangible about gloaming, global warming at a local level. But it's, it's more than just that, and the presentation will go into that. Um, this project is consistent with, long before myself or, or even Terrigen was around, the stated values of the community. Uh, these were values that we had no impact on, of course, that uh, have been stated over and over as important and real. And this is a project affords the county and Terrigen to collectively work with the community to act upon those values by thinking globally and acting locally. So we appreciate your, your attention tonight. Um, I'll seek to be brief. We want to be respectful of the, the, co the questions you might have as a result of what you've heard tonight, as well as the uncertain uh, comments we'll be receiving from the public. Um, so the structure of the uh, presentation that you see before you is, uh, is, is fairly simple. It's who are we, who is Terrigen, uh, what is the project, what are the impacts, and what are the benefits. Uh, I'm not seeking to be redundant in terms of what you've heard today. It's more to add some additional information and afford you uh, a, a perspective on the project from the applicant's perspective. So, so who is Terrigen? Um, uh, bottom line is we've, we've performed, we've developed, operated, built, more projects than, than anyone else in the state of California. California is unique, Humboldt is unique. These are special places. The laws are different here. Not only the laws, the um, how you interact with people, how you meaningfully engage with the community is different. And we understood that prior to every set, setting foot in the county. Um, but but stating, stating what you see in front of you, there's nobody that's more experienced at developing, building, and operating wind projects in California. Um, we built the, the developed, built, and operated the largest project in the world. Um, that's in Southern California. Uh, we'll talk about one of the references that was made to the Condor, that only other project in the world that has that. That is on a project that Terrigen developed, built, and operated, and operates today. Uh, we're based here in San Diego. Uh, we have staff across the country, but we're based here in California. Uh, we're privately held. Um, yes, uh, that's been a, a criticism, understanding the history of Humboldt County, but I want to be clear, the funds that come from the, uh, the firm that, that owns Terrigen, that effectively provides the capital, those funds are from the pensions of teachers, and firefighters, and police officers. Um, that's not a, a popular fact, but that's, that's the truth. Um, uh, we've also operated over 1,000 megawatts of projects in California. That's hundreds of, not thousands of turbines, and we're presently continuing to do that in many of the regions where wind exists today. So the, the project itself, you've heard this, but in, in summary, it's located in southern, southern Humboldt County. It's located uh, a couple miles south of Scotia. It's located on private land. To connect to the grid, there will be an over, a 23-mile uh, overhead transmission line. Uh, we'll connect at the Bridgeville substation. I'll explain the logic by how we assessed and selected that point. Uh, the wind resource, uh, is, there's no one more experienced in California than Terrigen, and this is a premier wind resource, not just in uh, the region, but in the entire state. Um, and the operations of the project, uh, Terrigen, we will uh, operate it uh, for the life of the duration of the project. Um, so why Humboldt, as the slide says? Uh, it's simple, it's the, f the fundamentals. Uh, any, any, not only any business, you, you assess the condition before you show up. And so we, we, in the wind development business, looked at the wind. Uh, wind is great, but if you can't get your product to market via, capa via available capacity, uh, it's really difficult to, to have that project work. 
So there's a transmission, there's available transmission. We'll talk about the additional benefits that this project affords uh, to the local transmission grid and regional grid that are additional benefits that are independent that we are paying for. And then more importantly, consistent with what we researched from you know, 2009 through 2012 through the Repower Humboldt Strategic Plan that's currently getting updated. These, the values of taking a role in your community the values of prioritizing climate change and acting, not just, not just participating and thinking globally, but acting locally, this affords that opportunity. And so we believe the fundamentals speak for themselves as to why this project is consistent and why it's not just a good project. It's a project you can act on and act locally upon. So um, how did we get here and what was the timeline? Short, short version is, I, I will seek not to read from too many of these slides, but we started out uh, in 2015-16, evaluating uh, after we had built a, a lot of projects uh, up to 105 different sites. Uh, that we narrowed that down to a short list of 10 within the state of California. We further uh, narrowed that down based upon a focus on the fundamentals. Again, every community is different. The wind is different. The transmission system is different. The permitting is different. And we further narrowed that down to uh, three projects, and that's supposed to say, I see, uh, interconnection. <laughs> Um, uh, we filed three interconnection requests in Northern California uh, for simple terms for the public, for the, uh, com the Planning Commission. That, ability, that gives us the ability to plug into the grid, to plug in, if you will, with our extension cord. Um, of those, two were deemed um, unfeasible. Uh, either the, the wind was, was not there uh, through the advancement, through the interconnection study process, which is guided not by PG&E, uh, but by CAISO, the grid operator. Those projects were deemed unfeasible. Uh, we do have another project that's come out of this in Southern California. Again, we started with 105. And, and here in the northern half of the state, we've got one remaining. And that's this project. That's your project. That's the community's project. Uh, addition, so beyond that, once we narrowed it down, uh, we, we, looked at, we did com completed some additional analysis. Uh, we studied the capacity of the substations, both the, the Humboldt substation, the other large substation in the county, it's a, that you see very close off of 101. We also studied the Bridgeville substation. The simple reason why we couldn't go to Humboldt is there's no capacity. Even if everyone would have invited us to build a power line through their backyard, which is not realistic, but even if they had, there's no capacity there. Um, we'll speak to how we're actually going to hopefully improve some of that because there are other resources in the area, such as the offshore project, which I believe is looking to tap to that. Uh, we'll speak to that in a bit. Um, but the additional analysis, uh, not surprisingly, uh, we measured the wind. We continue to measure the wind. That's the uh, lifeblood of our project. Um, we uh, had meaningful and continue to have meaningful stakeholder, stakeholder engagement. Even for those parties that, let's, they're just blatantly opposing our project. That's okay. It's important to not only sit up here and converse and engage with the public, it's important to adopt the project and uh, iterate on the project. And so we'll talk specifically about how we've done that. Um, we had to lease the site. We don't own the land. There was, uh, uh, out of respect to the, the county, there was a statement of, of securing or buying the land. We don't own the land. We're a tenant. Uh, those leases will eventually expire. Um, so we had to secure the land. It's 100% on, on private land. Uh, I want to take a special note here um, and recognize that it wasn't always uh, the land that's owned today, uh, which been, which been owned by the landowners uh, that will host the turbines for over 100, 150 years. It wasn't always that way. And we recognize that, we're empathetic to that, and we've sought to, to minimize our impacts. Um, it's not something we take lightly, our impact. It's, it's, a it's a project in your community. And so we, I just want to acknowledge that from the start. And then more, more uh, equally important is assessing the environmental conditions. So even if the fundamentals are in place to develop a project, acknowledging the environmental conditions and learning about them and understanding how do we improve how do we do it? Seek a seek what mandates that we do, and that is avoid. How do we minimize, and how do we mitigate for the impacts? I want to remind uh, the public, which has been a, a vital participant in our project, and uh, thankfully, planning commissioners for your, your unbiased willingness to listen to us. And that is, is that the CEQA doesn't require, nor is its goal, to have a project that has zero impacts. It's it's. And this is much as a, it's, it's uh, important to repeat this, not to remind you, but to understand is that it's not to give the developer or a, or a project applicant the perfect project. It's the idea is that through these meaningful engagement, we reduce our impacts by avoiding 
minimizing and mitigating the identified impacts. So um, narrowing it down, you know, how do we and why did uh, we narrow it to Monument and Bear River Ridge? Uh, the fundamentals, um, you know, good wind. We've, again, so much of the things that you've heard before, uh, we can talk in specifics. It's on managed land. Um, again, we want to be very respectful to the, uh, the citizens and the residents of Humboldt County that have been here for thousands of years. Uh, but it presently, and for the past at least 100 years, it's been actively grazed land. It's actively timber land. And in the event you, you vote against this project or the public has an opinion against this project, regardless, this land will continue to be managed as grazing and continue to be timber harvested as, as a managed pr uh, landscape. So we, we uh, understand their perspective, but the lands themselves will continue to be um, grazed and, and, and harvested for timber. Um, a, key, a key factor why Bear River Ridge versus uh, out near Bridgeville or Shively or Rainbow or Long Ridge, the other uh, many considerations locally that we factored in, uh, is that we, we couldn't deliver turbines. Just it's, it's a pretty simple answer. Um, the ridge is also, in order to, to be able to plug in uh, the, the size of, not only the size of the project, but the size of the project that would economically work, uh, the ridges are long enough and lie in a direction that are perpendicular largely to the direction of the wind blows. Um, one thing I want to highlight here, the, the next one, it, it's, it's maybe the, the fifth one on the list, but it's, it's the one that we started first, and that's meaningful engagement. Uh, we've met with over 150 parties, and we listened. I know I'm sitting here talking a lot, and I have a natural disposition to talk, but we listened, and we modified the project. We, uh, we moved turbines off of Shively Ridge, Rainbow Ridge, and, Ridge, and Long Ridge. Um, further, before we even submitted the application, we had been engaging with stakeholders, with agencies, and we removed Bridgeville from some consideration as well. Um, and then lastly, we, look, we sought, and in some cases have been quite successfully, at avoiding and minimizing the disturbances that we're having, not only on the, uh, the, known, envi excuse me, the known environment, but the homes that are in the area. It, it's irrelevant whether they're second homes or first homes, they're homes. And so we sought to adjust, and, you've, and uh, the county spoke to this, it's in the final EIR, that we've been able to adjust and remove based upon the possibility that we would have an impact on the residences. So um, I'm not a policy wonk, but it's important to note that the state has prioritized this, and more importantly, locally, the communities continue to prioritize this, and we believe want and continue to want to act into the future to have not just think globally, not just to listen to Greta talk about how important this is to future generations, but to act in Humboldt County. Climate change is real here. And the citizens of Humboldt County, the cities that are within the county, have prioritized renewable energy. There's a long history of resource extraction. And this project affords to, to stop re extracting a resource and exporting it out of the county. Evidence would be is that Redwood Coast Energy Authority has selected this project as one of its projects to provide energy locally to Humboldt County residents. These are some direct quotes from the Repower Humboldt strategic plan. It's currently being updated. The strategic partners and the public were involved in the formulation of this from 2009 through 2012. It may not have involved every single resident in the county, but it, it took three years of the brain trust, the environmental brain trust, the energy pioneers in Humboldt County long before we came along. These are direct quotes from that plan, from the executive summary. And so we'd like to say, you know, uh, that prepares us to seize the opportunities. This is an opportunity to think globally and act locally. So how has the project involved? We've, we've said um, in many of the, the odd members of the audience, perhaps the public watching online, the Board of Supervisors, county staff, which have employed a, a very rigorous approach. I'll speak to that in a bit. How has the project evolved as a result of all this? The la one of the worst things you can do, I'm certain we've all been there, is to engage with someone and then have them ignore you. It's not effective. It actually just ticks people off. 
And so uh, I've mentioned it actually has been over 150 meetings. That's a real number. That's not meeting with with any uh, one person 150 times. That's not an email. That's kneecap to kneecap interactions and listening and educating and then listening more. And so these three examples, incorporating stakeholder inputs, these are three direct examples that we received. Avoid Rainbow, Long, and Shively Ridge. Please don't put this under the ground for risk of the blowout. Please avoid the Matoll. I heard that while I was standing in the Matoll. And if you've been out there, there's not much out there. It's beautiful. Avoid putting them in the Matoll. And we listened. And we revised the project. Again, in the spirit of, of CEQA, what's required, the avoiding, minimizing, and mitigating. There's specific reasons why we've done this. And it's not just because of economics. It's because it's the, the right thing to do and it's consistent with the values of the community and it's as a result of the meaningful feedback and engagement that we've received from the various stakeholders. So, so not only why and how, but what are the results? Uh, and the results are, and I, I want to highlight even the, the, the pre-app column here. So I, I mentioned that before we began many of our studies and definitely before we submitted an application, we, we had extensive numbers of meetings with stakeholders. These are agencies, regulators. It could have been two guys out on the Matoll in their backyard. And, and we had a significant consideration uh, prior to even submitting the application. And so uh, what this demonstrates is that CEQA has worked and is working. This is an ongoing process. This isn't the end of the road. You are well aware of that. But it demonstrates that CEQA is, is working and we have a better project f as a result of it that's more consistent with the values of the community that has incorporated the feedback from the community. So we appreciate the opportunity to highlight that. Other impact reductions, and this, this is a significant consideration. Um, I want, there's a, a lot to the CEQA document about sensitive and natural communities, but one of the concerns was around these other types of land cover. And I want to highlight, even from not the pre-app, but from the draft until the, the final permanent, um, you know, there are, there's a significant reductions. And that continues as we move forward. So uh, it is important, you know, what are the impacts and how are we addressing them? There'll be separate slides there. And then lastly, to remind you, what are the benefits? I want to be cognizant of the time and make sure we have to build in time for the public. So I'll be expeditious here. So what are the impacts? You've heard them. They're in the final EIR. They're materially different than what was in the draft ERR. That's as a result of meaningful engagement. And also, I want to be clear. Um, I mentioned that no one's more experienced than Terrigen. The staff that's worked on this has worked on projects across the country. We've never been through a more rigorous process, not just because it makes you feel good that you have a capable staff. That's the facts. There are, no more, there are no more rigorous mitigations that are being employed on a wind farm in the United States today than this project. And I want to highlight the most important things that we're hearing about today. Um, that is turbines. So the, the facts are turbine fires are rare. Um, however, the, the turbines that are, that are considered, not the older turbines, and there's really two forms of, of wildfire risk associated with this project, the turbines risk and the transmission line, what uh, you see in reference to the Gentai, or the Gentai Connect line. I'll try to stick with the same terminology, but the transmission line is what I'll call it. So the turbines themselves are, fires are rare. Uh, I can, we've provided the county some documentation around this, but uh, new, newer turbines, like the ones we're talking about, not older turbines, uh, have a fire, built-in fire suppression systems. There's actively suppresses and detects the fires. To uh, keep it simple, it's, it's very much like, although it's much more sophisticated, uh, zonal fire and, and fire management inside of a, a building. And, and they're automated systems. Uh, it consists of a smoke detector and a chemical sprinkler system. Uh, what is more common and what's in the news and, and frankly what is a very justifiable concern. We acknowledge it that this is a risk and how do we manage for that risk and not only prepare for it if it were to happen. Uh, is the transmission lines. Facts are important here as well. It doesn't still, it doesn't reduce the fact that this is a, a real concern. Um, but the facts are important is, and we look at the root cause analysis of many of the fires, most of them are from significantly older lines. These are new lines. These are the only lines we're going to be managing. This isn't, we don't, we don't own hundreds of thousands of miles of lines. They'll be monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They'll be built in redundancy. As we mentioned, this is on managed timberlands. So in addition to our staff that will be on site, 
monitoring it 24 hours a day, both remotely and locally. Um, in addition to that, uh, our primary landowners, Russ Ranch and HRC, are actively on the landscape every day. Our tower techs will be climbing these towers, these 47 towers, every day. There's a reason for that. Um, PG&E is a bad word here. We're not PG&E. This is a privately managed line. PG&E doesn't tell us what to do. They don't control what we do. They don't control the operation of that line. We do. We'll be using not only state-of-the-art equipment, state equipment, but uh, it was mentioned and noted in the final EIR that there's an 80-foot wide corridor. There will be minor vegetation growing under there. But this will effectively be a clear cut. We're, we're mitigating for it, so I'd rather call it what it is. An important thing, it's important to acknowledge the risk and to state how we're, we're seeking to avoid any risk, but in the event something were to happen, we're prepared for that as well. It's important to note that uh, there's, there's really two primary ways you prepare for this. What you see on the screen is the execution, the implementation of that plan. The two primary ways you, you prepare for this, part, you, you partner with known entities that are already managing the risks because they have a fiduciary and a financial responsibility to do so. HRC has a billion dollar investment. They're not exactly popular in this county, but they want to maintain and manage that investment and protect it. So they, they've completed a fire risk analysis. Much of that involves the project area that we've completed. They completed that independent to protect for their own assets they're protecting, where they've identified high, high fire risk areas, low fire risk areas, south facing slopes. And then ahead of every fire season, not only are they required to, or per the Forest Practice Act, they fire a, a fire plan where they go out and assess, okay, what happens if we encounter an ignition? Where do we do? How do we approach that? What are the responsibilities? And so these are some of the steps to describe the plan to deal with it. These aren't steps we made up. These are proven steps that CAL FIRE has blessed. So we'll be on top of that, on top of what HRC does, which we'll have actually more staff than we will every day on this land. On top of that, we'll have a redundant plan not an identical copy, but a redundant plan, which is the key part about managing any risk, is redundancy. And so it is a risk 100%, but we have a plan, we understand how to do it, we're gonna be working with the best experts, and we're not PG&E. There's other impacts, um, you've heard them today. Uh, simply put, we've, avoidance is the first step, mitigating is the second step, or excuse me, minimizing and mitigating is the, the third step in terms of how you seek what, what CEQA requires us to do. We, the biggest thing we've been able to do in terms of avoiding impacts is reducing the turbines from 60 to 47. For every single species that we encountered, we, were, we had positive results by avoiding reducing the turbines. Um, we are not entering any murrelet habitats. We're total avoidance of all old growth redwood. It's also a policy of HRC. Regardless of how popular or unpopular they are, factually, we're not doing that. There's multiple years of radar studies. And the mitigation that we proposed, as, as the county detailed, um, you know, it's dependent upon how you do the math. It was double checking between six and 12 times net beneficial to the species. But what, what isn't quantified here, which is confirmed by Dr. Rick Golightly, which in the region is the most esteemed scientist around the Marble Muralette. And unfortunately, he had food poisoning. Hopefully, he'll be here next week. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Dr. Golightly said, you know, the best thing you can do for the Muralette is to build this project. Because what actually kills Muralettes is every time we have to bring in a tanker into Humboldt Bay to refill the uh, Humboldt Bay generating station. And if there's an oil and gas spill, which has occurred and likely will occur in the life of this project, you kill more Muralettes out at sea. It's a seabird by virtue of refueling that power plant. So it's important to understand that's not quantified in the final EIR, but global warming is real. Climate change is happening and affecting all of these species. Those are not completely quantified, the impact this has positively to climate change. On the northern spotted owl, there's multiple years of NSO studies. When I say multiple years, there's over 17 years of data that we walked into with HRC. So we had a known condition. 
They were evaluating for different reasons. The scientists can explain those reasons why the surveys are slightly different. But the bottom line is we had a very strong basis of understanding and how to avoid all activity centers, even off of HRC's land. Furthermore, we have a, so we have 100% of avoidance and the mitigation is not only proven, uh, proven to be effective, but it's, it's quite popular that are proposed and there's multiple options that we'll be held accountable to. Other impacts you've heard, again, the county, um, I don't want to minimize any of these, uh, but they are all equally important and it's why we have mitigation and have sought to minimize and avoid and minimize and mitigate. Uh, bats, um, the, one, uh, the, the one tough part about bats, frankly, is that we, uh, due to the Frick paper and the many references you might hear from the public, is that there's a, a reference to that we're, we're gonna be having a, a, a population size impact. But as a, a common sense, you know, non-Northern Spotted Owl or non-bat expert, we, we have them experts that consulted, the county has their experts, is that no one can tell me the size of the population of the bats that we're having a quote unquote population size impact on. I don't know how that math adds up. I'm not here to argue that, but fundamentally it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. But my opinion is, is not relevant on this. The law is what guides us here. And regardless of what my opinion is on, on undefining or defining a, the size of the population, we have an obligation legally to reduce that impact. And so that there's, a, there's a plan in place to address that, to mitigate for that. In terms of, of raptors, the county again highlighted through their, through their report, it is not, I wanna be clear to the public, the, the EIR is not the applicant's report. We provide data to it, but it's a common misconception of the public that, that it's our document. It is by no means our document. Uh, there are, there's a low risk, particularly when you compare it to other wind projects. That may not make anyone comfortable, but that's a fact. And the mitigation has been proven effective. One thing I want to highlight about benefits of the project, particularly as it relates to pole retrofitting, is that we will be, as part of the project, undergrounding over five miles of existing PG&E lines. These are the highest risk, highest risk wildfire lines and are similar for risk for raptors that roost on these poles. There's five mile, over five miles of PG&E, what are called distribution voltage. They're the ones that you see that feed this building, that feed your homes, feed businesses, that provide the power, and we'll be undergrounding those. That's factored into the final EIR, but it, it materially helps us avoid risk. And, and it's not by any means the last impact, it's just one I do wanna highlight, again, we. I've gotten to know uh, a few of the parties uh, as it pertains to cultural resources. Um, as the EIR does state, we are disturbing cultural resources. The best thing we can do for any imp impact that we are having or would have as a result of this project is avoid. We have avoided turbines where we can from 60, excuse me, from 60 to 47. We've minimized the footprint. But I want, to be, I want to be clear, as consistent with what the county said, is that, what, that there is a significant and unavoidable impact to this, and we respect and understand and hear the concerns. How, I also want to acknowledge, though, that the project is not eco economically feasible without all 23 turbines that are, pr that are proposed for Bear River Ridge. It's actually, uh, that's incorrect, it's actually 20 turbines. The representative in the draft EIR showed 23. We have reduced that to 20. That may seem trivial, uh, to, to the public, but we have reduced it. And going below 47 turbines makes the project uneconomic and unfeasible, which is inconsistent with the goal of, of the document of the EIR. So what have we done? Again, we've reduced the turbines impacts. Uh, the county uh, gave some indication. On FAA lights, we would love to have fewer of them. The FAA guides that. We seek and will work with them and have worked with them to minimize those, but that is an FAA decision. It's a safety decision. Visual impacts, uh, these are, uh, almost all of these are directly from the, uh, the draft and final EIR. I wanna uh, highlight that the county actually selected, we provided 40, I think it was 48 or 54 different viewpoints by where we could take pictures. Um, we can talk about the, the, uh, the, the lens and the camera and how we use that if, if you so desire. But uh, this is what it would look like from Scotia, Scotia, excuse me. Pictures say a lot, so I'm gonna just let the pictures speak for themselves. The top is here is without. This is a view from Rio Dell at, I believe it's 5.7 miles. And, and if, if, apologies if you can't see. Um, feel free to, to get up. I, I, this is the county's planning commission. Um, uh, <laughs> or, 
Commissioner Ford is asking, or Planning Commission Director. Um, but these are in the draft EIR. These are available. Um, and I want to highlight, you know, we, uh, I mentioned we've had over 150 meaningful meetings with stakeholders, with residences. This is, this is from a, a residence at two miles. It is an impact. There are benefits, though, and, and I want to highlight that. You know, the impacts identify the impacts. There are benefits. Climate change is real. So what are they? It's local clean power. We can provide a lot of clean local energy locally. You no longer have to import energy. There's one misconception that I want to I highlight that the public has about that if this project doesn't come along that we can still fight climate change. You absolutely can. This can be a part of the solution. This is not the final solution. It's not one solution. However, as uh, RCEA highlighted just last night, the Humboldt Bay Generating Station provides, I believe, almost 40% of the power locally. This could displace a lot of that. One other thing that hasn't gotten near enough uh, to our, we, we just haven't done a good job at, but it's been highlighted as a result of the, the uh, wildfires that have occurred and, and more recently the PSP that uh, shut out power to the area. Um, and that is the, the local grid improvements that will be made as a direct consideration of this. This is uh, any generator, that being whether you're a biomass plant, a solar plant, um, a wind project in this case. Any generator, when we study the grid and we plug into the grid, KISO, the grid operator, along with the transmission line owner, where you're going to plug in your project into the grid, uh, does several years of studies. It takes a long time. We started that back in 2016 for this project. And the result of that, which we have since signed, is an interconnection agreement, which details out in intricate detail what we will be doing. And so what we will be doing is over $14 million, and the, this is not a, a made up word, it's actually in the legal document, the contract, reliability network upgrades. The Humboldt Wind Project will enhance the reliability of the local grid out of our pocket. Some of that will come back to us, absolutely, like any generator, we get there's a reimbursement factor, but over $14 million that we come out of our pocket. I can tell you $1.3 million of that is at the Humboldt Bay, Gener Humboldt Bay substation. Because we're on a, a grid that's connected, m I, we can provide the breakout to the, com to, the, uh, to the planning commissioners. Much of that is at the Cottonwood. There's, subs there's transmission line upgrades. Those are significant upgrades. Furthermore, if you look at, uh, it's not in the interconnection agreement, but there's over five miles of high-risk PG&E distribution lines. We are putting those underground. They run right through the existing HRC property today. Greenhouse gas reduction, there's been some debate over about that. The county provides some staff at the calculations, how they attain that. Uh, I want to highlight uh, that, you know, the, the most common things we as, as customers, as ratepayers, as citizens do, that we often think we can, can impact global warming is by um, buying a, a new Tesla. Not everybody can afford one. I can't. But this removes the equivalent of 82,000 <laughs> cars from the road. Uh, there's other benefits. Corporate America is not popular in Humboldt County. Let's just acknowledge that. But we'll, we'll immediately become the second largest taxpayer in the county by a significant margin. Another factor, and we can be a part of the solution, Solar can be a part of the solution. But in terms, of, in, in, in terms of what does the county get back? If you just buy renewable energy or someone puts it on their home, what does the county get back? Solar is a tax exempt in the state of California. It's exempt from property taxes. There'll be jobs associated with it. They will start and they will end like any construction project. Many of those jobs can come here locally. We've, we've met with uh, Mercer, Mercer Frazier and OM Industries, I know those, the, the heads of those companies well. We've had them out on site. We've been working with them extensively um, to address you know, uh, a popular topic. We've done union jobs. We've done non-union jobs. But there's significant jobs that can come from this. There's 15, up to 15 permanent jobs um, to, to, to address something. There's many comments have been made. These are not jobs at an In-N-Out restaurant. There's no, there's no, there's, that's a quality job. I, I worked at a hamburger place, so I'm not belittling a job at In-N-Out. <laughs> but, but these jobs that have been compared to a job at a hamburger joint, and it's just not the same thing. 
And more importantly, the values that this community has held long before we showed up, this is consistent with those values of thinking globally and acting locally. So in conclusion, I just want to thank you for your attention. I think the public for their feedback, whether you like our project, dislike it or not, you have the opportunity. This, this CEQA, the draft EIR, the, the final EIR is proof that the CEQA process has worked and is working. It's resulting in a dramatically reduced project footprint that's included direct avoidance, minimization, and direct mitigation with the performance standard. And it's important to note that that's with some of the most rigorous mitigation measures imposed on any wind project in the country. Humble to special. This is evidence of that. At the same time, the goal of the, the EIR, the goal of this process and the permit that we're, we're seeking to you to act upon is triggered on having a project. And factually, the project is marginally economical. We would know we've done this more than anyone else in the, in, in California for certain, meaning we cannot afford to lose a single turbine, a single one. The Humboldt Wind Project is part of the solution to climate change. This is your opportunity, this is our opportunity to combat climate change locally. Think globally, act locally, act in Humboldt. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Nathan. I think what we'll do now is I think we'll take about 15 minutes and we will allow the commissioners to ask questions based on staff uh, presentation. And if you'd stay at the uh, podium, uh, Nathan, there may be questions for you. And we'll take a recess at 6.15. And so with that, uh, any of the commissioners who listen and have uh, questions, uh, that's uh, either on staff report or on uh, Nathan's presentation. And Chairman Morris, Chairman Morris and, and Planning Commissioners, I would uh, uh, let you know that we have a uh, staff of experts here. Uh, I by no means am a CEQA expert. I'm not a Northern Spotted expert. We have a staff of experts here to, if you have in-depth questions, we'd be happy to answer those to your satisfaction. That'd be fine. That'd be fine. Yeah. 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 I was going to question first. You want to take, take a recess first? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're we're, we're going to we're going to change our schedule here at the at the request of several uh, the commissioners. We will take a recess for uh, uh, 15 minutes and then we'll come back and then we'll start. So I apologize for that. So everyone can unwind. Thank you. get our meeting back on on focus here uh, we're a little bit past our uh, re our uh, break time so uh, we left off where the uh, it's time for the commissioners to uh, uh, get any clarifications or uh, more information that uh, may have been uh, hidden in the um, in the staff report and or the applicants report so at this time, I'll open it up to the commissioners for questions to staff and or the applicant. Noah? Thanks. Um, thank you all. Um, I just want to take this opportunity <coughs> quickly to note my ex parte communications. Uh, Nathan sort of alluded to this, but um, I had uh, Met Nathan and a couple of other TerraGen staff at a um, mixer early this year um, at Humboldt Bay Provisions. Um, spoke with them a little bit about the project then. Um, did exchange a couple of emails, maybe several emails with Nathan, but they were always about trying to set up a meeting that actually didn't happen, so they weren't really very substantive. Uh, substantive. Um, and I want to note also that the local liaison for TerraGen is Natalinda Lapp. She is a longtime friend and former colleague of mine. We worked together uh, at Epic for many years. I have had maybe three conversations over the past year with her. And uh, the first of those occurred right around the time that I took a helicopter trip um, that TerraGen put on and offered to a number of interested stakeholders in the community um, when we flew up from um, Ronerville, uh, Ronerville Airport and went over the ridges where the planned uh, project would occur. So I just wanted to put that out there. I've also, of course, 
had conversations with many, too many people in the community to mention. Um, um, I don't want to, I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I really wanted to defer most of them until after the, the, the public has a chance to speak. So, um, but I did just want to put one question out. Um, I guess it's sort of for the staff, it's also directed at Nathan as well. Um, many of the, what I anticipate, most difficult, contentious discussions we may have over how this project could be additionally mitigated or scaled or conditioned or so forth come down to the point that Nathan made in his last uh, slide, which is the uh, slim financial margin that makes this possible. Um, but what I guess I'd like to know is since since that does become the answer to many of the things that we might consider as project options, were the financial considerations that lead you to that conclusion shared with the county? In other words, was there an independent third party or the county who was able to look at your financial models, ask questions and say, well, what if it was done at this scale and it could be penciled out differently over a longer time? Because I think, um, I, I anticipate we're gonna run up against that in our discussions. So I just wanted to put that question out there for, I guess, the county. Did you, did you feel that you were able to see inside the financial black box, as it were, about what would make this project economically viable or not? We have not gotten the financials on the project. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'll, that's all I got for now. Okay. Anyone else? Questions? Alan. I also will disclose that I've had multiple discussions with Nathan and Adeline uh, at different times about the project, but my specific question would probably be for Nathan, and uh, it's why with the, uh, the risk of fire, as we've seen, was there consideration of doing the whole transmission line underground versus going overhead? I just something I thought about today when you were talking up there so that's really the only question I wanted to have at this time thank you Commissioner excuse me thank you Commissioner Bongio uh, so just to, to repeat the question was there a uh, consideration to give into undergrounding the 23 miles yes yes there absolutely was um, and uh, the reality is it's it's at least uh, twice as expensive to do that um, I w I'd like to uh, if I could um, uh, uh, Commissioner Levy, uh, uh, slightly address. So, we, uh, uh, Planning Director Ford is correct. We did not provide a financial model to the county. We did provide an independent third party analysis about the alternatives <coughs> that compared uh, utility rates of return. We are not a utility, but to, to provide some perspective on that. And the results of that have been provided to the county. And it's clear, abundantly clear, that uh, the alternatives that are proposed, why they're so uh, infeasible. I don't, I don't want to, that's, I'm, I'm not contradicting what uh, Planning Building Director Ford said. Um, that's correct. We did not provide a financial model, but we did do an independent analysis of the alternatives proposed mm -hmm. to, re to address the reduction of, of turbines and whatnot. Is that, and where would we find that? Because I don't remember coming across that, but there's a lot of material here. Absolutely. That'll be, so that will be included in the next staff report that comes out? because that is referenced in the statement of overriding considerations and that will be an attachment to that. Okay. Mike. And I too would like to disclose I've had a couple of coffee times with uh, uh, Nathan and Natalyn um, just to get information uh, generally. Uh, I did not disclose any Thing else I was there to listen and to get a little bit more information uh, hands-on um, did not go view the project in any form or fashion um, but did meet a couple of times thank you mr. Ryan. chairman uh, just wanted to uh, note for the record that I also had coffee with Nathan um, about a year ago and <laughs> Uh, expressed my concerns about the project at the time to him um, and traded uh, 
at least 25 texts with Natalie trying to schedule a follow-up meeting and never could we uh, be in the same place at the same time. Um, but Mr. Chairman, I just want to note that this 800 some page FEIR was just delivered, at least to me, um, Tuesday at the end of the end of business, and I didn't receive until today the actual appendices that had the actual letters in them. And so, until I've had an opportunity to read the comment letters in their entirety, I'd really like to reserve my questions for the staff and the applicant until I've had an opportunity to review that. Yeah, that'd be fine. We're, we are going to have multiple meetings on this. At least I think that's the schedule, and, and based on the uh, the size and scope of this project, tonight not going to be the last. So you'll have plenty of opportunity. Any other questions? Uh, yes, I have a few questions. Um, I'd like to disclose that I've not had coffee or any other beverage. Um, <clears throat> uh, however, <laughs> since we are talking about our ex parte communications, uh, I, although I, I haven't had any um, comestible or beverage with any of the uh, applicants. I, I have, however, however, had uh, Beth Burks from LACO Associates to my class, to my EIA class, to talk about uh, planning like I normally do every year. And one of the topics last time was, of course, this project, because that's what they were working on. It was an overview of the, the project and in no way influenced me. Um, haven't been bribed or uh, anything. I've had no helicopter rides. Um, Let's see, I am also uh, friends with Natalyn DeLapp, and so I have had several conversations with Natalyn about wind energy generally in the past, uh, but not specifically about the details of this project. I have personally driven down because I was curious to, to see where it would be, and so um, I have viewed the, the sites on my own, not, not with any, anyone else. So. I have a, a few questions and I have just a point of clarification. I, I feel like maybe there's been some confusing language around mitigation for some people. And so I'd just like to uh, talk about that a little bit. So mitigation is a broad term that describes what is done to reduce an impact. And avoidance is a type of mitigation. So um, earlier there were it was thrown around like mitigation and minimization and avoidance. Well, um, minimization and avoidance are both types of mitigation. And uh, according to Noble et al. and in EIA, we like to depict it as a uh, upside down pyramid where, where the goal is to avoid. So the biggest part of the pyramid is avoidance. And then the middle part is the minimization. So to minimize an impact. And then um, the smallest part of the pyramid, ideally, is compensation. And so although that wasn't mentioned, indeed a lot of the mitigation that is referred to in this FEIR is, of course, compensation. Compensation is not just money, it often is, but it can be relocation of, of resources. For example, often schools are moved even uh, for oil and gas projects. So compensation is a... Um, it's uh, the, the, usually, uh, we like to say the last resort, but it is a form of mitigation, and it is here in this project. So um, <clears throat> now for my questions, uh, I, I've been writing them down, so I'm just going to go through them. So I was wondering why uh, Bear River Ridge was not eliminated at the very beginning when you were looking at the alternatives due to the cultural resources impacts. Uh, and I, you, I, I'll just go through my questions, I think, would be easiest, and then uh, if, it, if anyone wants to address any of them, then that could take place afterwards. Um, in terms of the biological, uh, it was described that there would be no construction during the breeding season. Uh, but how will that breeding season be determined? So I, I would just like to know whether that's going to be direct monitoring or whether that's actually going to just rely on records or historical breeding seasons. So obviously the, the, the former would be the preference, so we would like to, to see that be um, pretty serious monitoring uh, in terms of uh, the breeding season to avoid construction during. Um, then, uh, let's see. Oh, yes, yeah, so uh, several times 
there was mention made of the numbers of avian deaths. And in some cases, we're talking about sensitive species, and in some cases, we're talking about common birds. But in, in all cases, it was numbers. And so I would like to see the percentages in terms of what percentage of the current population that is, understanding that sometimes we are talking about migratory or ephemeral populations. But nonetheless, I would like to just see that, and uh, I think it's easier for the population to, for our uh, human <laughs> species population, to see that as a, as a density. So it's, it's difficult for most people to understand how many deaths, you know, <laughs> it sounds like a lot or maybe it sounds like a little. So it needs to be relative to the population. Um, otherwise, you say 114 deaths, and some people go, <gasps> and some people say, oh, that's nothing. But, I mean, it's not very meaningful just throwing out that number. So uh, that, and that's for several, like I said, for several sections of the biological, I saw that. Um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, so uh, I was wondering if there could be some further explanation or uh, attention given to comparing the impact of forest removal, for example, that has a time scale of about 50 to 80 years for carbon neutrality uh, with a project with a 30-year planned lifespan. So uh, this comes up often. I, I, I work in, in forest research and, and uh, and in, in biomass and utilization and, and all of that. And so it, it is an important thing to address. So in, what is the time scale in terms of the carbon neutrality that we're trying to go for? Um, understanding, of course, that you know our goals as a state are set over a very short time period, which always creates issues in terms of trees, which are over a longer time period. And uh, I just think it would be clearer if if that was uh, discussed. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would like to to know if there was any uh, discussion or attention given to purchasing some land instead of leasing it, so as to compensate. And I know it. I just said the goal is usually to avoid and then minimize, but to compensate the, the tribes, as in particular the WIAT, for some of the um, unavoidable significant impacts. So uh, that, that may well not be an option, but it may be. And so I'd like to know if there was any discussion of that and, and whether that would be an option. Um, <clears throat> Oh, the FAA uh, lighting requirements. Um, I would really like to see that addressed, hopefully next time. Um, I think it would be good to have some idea of what the lighting impact actually will be. Uh, right now, it's, it's kind of an unknown. And so even if it has to be a range that's given, I would just like to have something to work with in terms of the lighting impacts. And that's all I have for now. Thank you. Peggy. Um, I haven't met with anybody either. He called, but I told him I'd rather wait for the public meeting. Um, I, would, I would like to know if there's any consideration giving to any kind of local um, community financial benefits. I know with the offshore wind, there was a discussion of providing a 5% benefit to fund local projects. Um, there's a lot of environmental, cultural impacts from this project when there's, they're proposing an offshore project that could happen soon and could, um, you know, I think they said about five years it's gonna take to get through the whole um, environmental process there. But I think that those impacts um, would be less than this and um, it could serve the community and, and I'm also not really clear because I know there's all these complicated legal agreements that you enter into but whether or not this local community really will benefit from the energy generated or where, where I know you said it'll provide power to so many people but 
unless that's in writing and that's you know definite it may be not happening because what i'd be more interested in if is when our power goes out are these wind uh, mills going to be able to generate local power or is it just going to go somewhere else and i think it is really important to look at what the financial benefits are to the local community if it if we gain nothing i mean we all do support renewable energy throughout the state I, we'd like to be energy independent but not at the expense of everyone else taking the resources and our local community not getting anything other than the negative. There was also discussion about what happens after 30 years. I know I saw some comments like, who's taking these things down? They look like they, they're hard to get there. They're, there's lots of concrete in the ground. And who's going to do, if, if you don't continue to operate them after the 30 years or the rest ranch doesn't renew the, um, the leases, who's going to um, take them down and who's going to restore those areas that have been disturbed? because three acres of concrete is a lot of concrete, and um, I'd like to know the answer to that. And of course, I, I support the tribe. I, I will admit that I worked for the Weyot tribe a number of years ago. It's been probably 30 years ago, but um, I do support um, preservation of cultural resources or, or um, repl you know, th there's always an alternative. And I think that the tribes, there's there's been a lot of effort in looking at the the birds and the birds, of course, are important. But but the cultural resources to the the people that were the first residents here, and have pretty much you know um, not been given much of a, a a shot. And that's one of the the things we're talking about with the the community benefits. If if the offshore people can provide a five percent interest, they were talking about supporting the condor, the restoration of the condor, maybe support for uh, um, other bird. Um, local community um, agencies that are that are out there trying to protect the, the there's got to be something that we get because all of us want to think that we're going to get something and then when the ink dries we find out we don't really get anything other than the negative and i just have seen that happen way too many times and not think that you know someone coming up here who's the largest wind provider in the state ha you know isn't going to gain something so that's what i think Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted to request from staff, if it's in the d final EIR, please point me in that direction, or if not, if you could put this together for the next meeting. But I was curious if there's a list of mitigation measures that were considered for the impacts that were considered significant and unavoidable, things that could have been done to mitigate them but were determined to be infeasible either for financial or other reasons so that we can have a discussion about exactly why those were eliminated. And I'd really like it to include any that were, that were included in public comments, um, especially from uh, the tribes as well as state and um, environmental groups. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll ask the question for the director. Uh, Director, would you uh, rather have your staff verbally respond tonight, or would you rather uh, put this in, in a written form and uh, have some answers for us at our next meeting, which is next week? We would far prefer to put it in writing and give it back to you for next week. Okay. I would think that would be a little, little bit more concise, and, and we might get a little bit more succinct answers rather than a verbal presentation. So hopefully uh, you folks have, have got those questions written down and we can expect answers to uh, the concerns and questions of the commission yep. next meeting. I will beg your indulgence on one thing, though, is that uh, we are going to, uh, we anticipate sending the staff report out tomorrow. I don't know that we're going to have these written in time to go out with the staff report tomorrow, but we will get it to you as early as we can next week. That'll, that'll be fine. I mean, we're, I think we're used to getting supplemental at the last moment, so that would be fine. So with that, uh, I will now open this up for public comment from the general public. Anyone wishing to speak on this, please approach the podium. And as you can all see, it is a packed room, so I'm going to... Uh, Sorry, uh, Chair Morris, one of the things we tried to do was to have people fill out uh, uh, comment cards. And so what you're able to do there is, is read out a few of those and have people orderly come forward to the, uh, the podium. I, I hope that's helpful. 
Well, okay, that uh, might speed the process up a little bit. I do have a uh, quite a quite a list here of, of uh, names. And so what I'll do is I will read out three, and if those three could line up, and then we'll uh, maybe we can keep the process moving along and and, uh, and save some time as people uh, need to clear the aisles and get themselves to the podium. And the first name I have here is Jane Hartford. I have a Michael Evanson and a Sharon Chacal. And I hope I pronounced these right. Go ahead. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Jane Hartford. Uh, I just moved to Scotia a couple of years ago. And so this project comes as a very unpleasant surprise to me. Um, it would totally uh, destroy the aesthetics uh, that I moved up here for. Um, uh, what I would request of you uh, is to please read in the DIR uh, section 4.8.8. Uh, this lists the uh, cumulative environmental threats to public health and hazards and upsets in the areas of aesthetic pollution, air pollution, water pollution, and noise pollution, among others. These things are really serious and um, uh, really are important to me, um, along with everything else that has been uh, mentioned. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for your attention. I was, I've been really impressed by uh, your conscientiousness. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michael Evanson. Michael Evanson here um, from the Matoll. Uh, I wanted to start off by uh, thanking Nathan um, for um, saying avoid the Matoll, but that's not exactly what really we talked about. And, and, um, and I, I, I was kind of surprised because when we met with Nathan and, and the team, uh, I specifically requested more than once uh, his notes, I, I, I requested of Natalyn, the notes that they were going to carry forward so that we would make sure that we weren't mischaracterized. And uh, despite repeated requests for those notes so that we could all be on the same page, never got them. So come up to this meeting and, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm sorry that Nathan <coughs> mischaracterized this and it, it made me uh, feel that there could be other things that he's mischaracterized. Uh, you know, the company is owned by Energy Capital Partners, which is a mega corporation, does energy, does fracking, does all kinds of fossil fuels. So the commitment of the owners is not necessarily to renewables. It's to making money. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But it has to be up, up in front. Um, we're talking about s significant unavoidable impacts. Now that gives you the right to deny this project on that basis. So if you have that right, you don't have to give it away. We have a history in this county of people with a half a billion dollars having their way and we get left with what's left. And we've lost our fish. We don't have a fishing industry, really, to speak of. We, you look in the hills, we don't really have the timber industry that we could be having. Um, there were 113 mills in, in Humboldt County, and we have Schmidt, Bauer, and HRC. What I'm saying is that when you're, take, when you're dealing with a, a company this powerful, the county does not have the power to enforce anything. That company is going to spend you out. And, and, and um, so even if the mitigations are on paper, and we've seen this with other corporations, it doesn't mean that that's what happens. And I, I appreciate that you're looking for something concrete here. But I'm not sure you can enforce anything concrete with them. When you dance with the devil, You've got to expect to get burned. Thank you. 
Uh, next speaker will be Sharon Chacall, and following that will be Larry Goldberg, Richard Stewart, and Barbara Guest. Larry Goldberg, Richard Stewart, and Sarah Guest. Richard Stewart, and I'm a local resident, and I've lived here for 70 years. And I've seen what big business has done to this county over and over and over. And a lot of bad choices, <coughs> bad choices. And I'm totally against this project. And not necessarily for anything other than the the pristine beauty. Excuse me, sir. I don't know that they can hear you. Can you redirect Just, the mic? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Is that better? <laughs> okay. Anyway, the beauty of the ridge is going to be lost forever. And I don't think it's worth giving to a big company from out of the area that is, once again, taking our resources. And it seems to me like we have made a lot of mistakes with the cutting of the redwoods, the nuclear power plant, the two pulp mills, if you live downwind from them. I mean, it's, you could go on and on and on. And I think this is another mistake that's probably going to happen. But I got to say, I'm, I'm against it. And I am a constituent, and I will vote against whoever votes for it. Uh, excuse me. If, if you could hold the applause, uh, this, we need to, to keep this on a, on a uh, basis where we don't intimidate someone or, or unduly influence someone. So I think there's other areas that are better suited for this wind farm and not here on our ridge. And also, the ridge itself has been rated as, I think they rate them as one, two, three, and four. Four being the worst place to put it because of the environmental impact. And this ridge is a three. So how does that work into saying yes to this project? I mean, when there's other, other areas that are probably a one and a two of impact so anyway I'm, I'm pretty pretty upset about the whole thing and I know a lot of other people are too so with that well thank you thank you speaker next speaker Larry Goldberg good evening thank you thank you for holding this meeting here my name is Larry Goldberg I'm a 41 year resident of Humboldt I'm a lifelong environmentalist. I am a member of 350 Humboldt, a climate uh, action group. I'm also on the Redwood Coast Energy Authority Community Action Advisory Committee, but I'm speaking for none of those. I'm speaking as just a citizen of Humboldt. And I'm also a 30-year solar advocate. I've been promoting solar here since the late 70s, and I started the first municipal solar utility program back in 1979, leasing solar at that time. So I've been involved in the energy field for many, many years. In the past week, we've received some very stark news, new information. 11,000 scientists have come out to tell us that we are going to be facing untold suffering due to climate crisis. We are in a climate crisis right now, and it's only going to get worse. It's a stark warning that's come to the world and unless we act immediately and decisively, locally, the future may be ever-increasing sea levels, drought, wildfire, insect outbreaks, and widespread tree die-offs. Here in Humboldt County, Redwood Coast Energy Authority has adopted a plan to have 100% renewable energy by 2030. I personally have what's called a nanogrid. During the power outage, I didn't even feel it. I have solar that's powering two houses. I have battery backup system, and I did just fine. My system cost $50,000 to put in. To do an equivalent system across the county for everyone in this county would cost billions. 
I believe in solar. I think solar is our part of our solution, but it's not going to meet the kinds of needs we have to reduce our carbon footprint today. What we're doing right now is we have to look to the future and to our children's future, and we have to start looking at climate change as a crisis. In 1983, I was part of a group that did what's called the Humboldt, Independent, uh, Humboldt Independence Project, looking at creating independent power for Humboldt County. A major component back in 1983 was wind. The wind site we have here is unique to entire West Coast. <coughs> I want to propose that we move forward with this project if possible. It's not without impacts, but I believe in the long term it's going to really make a difference for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. So, uh, Barbara, and the next three will be, a, a, be Beverly Chang, Frank Basic, and Tom Wheeler. Hello, my name is Barbara Guest. I'm a resident of Redcrest, and that's very close to the construction site that uh, is being proposed. Um, I had prepared some writing, so I didn't screw up too much. I want to say that I feel the final EIR did not address my concerns adequately. I feel the responses were actually patronizing and that the Stantec or the, the people who did this did not address the second main cause of wind turbine failure, and that is fire. Instead, they had 24 pages on something called wild land fire without letting you know or the public know that this wild land fire will be caused directly by the wind turbines. I'm um, actually um, upset that Nathan says that it's rare. It's a rare event for a turbine to catch fire. There was a fire on October 30th down in Kern County at Mojave. Was that one of your projects? Please, please address the commission. Well, at any rate, I have the Case Ness wind turbine accident report, 32 pages of only 2018 and 2019 to date, and page after page, fire. This is a worldwide report. This uh, follows all, all accidents on all wind turbines that they are notified of. And page after page, fire. Oregon, Iowa, Pennsylvania, Germany, Norway. There's, I hope that all of you Google. You can get this report for free online. It's 240 pages. They've been tracking accidents at wind turbines for, since the 1980s. And yes, fire is not rare. And all we need is one. Because at 600 feet in the air, these fires will not just get extinguished like they hope with the new um, equipment. They will burn out. That's what's happening across America. A fire, it burns out. 200 gallons of hydraulic fluid is in that nacelle, and it will burn, and then it will spread. And unless Nathan is going to cement every ridge down there, it's going to be a wildfire caused by the wind turbines. And this is what's been omitted from this report. It's not telling you that the wind turbines themselves, not the transmission lines, I'm not even talking PG&E. I'm talking the nacelle, the tower itself, that's 600 feet in the air and cannot be extinguished. Thank you. I hope you vote no. I hope you vote alternative one. No build, no build, no build. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Beverly Chang. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Beverly Chang, and I'm your two-mile example from your screens today. Um, as I received a public notice, Humboldt County Planning Commission notice of public hearing and intent to certify an environmental impact report, no date, advising that no future legal action may be taken in regards to this project unless future anticipated complaints are recorded into the record of these uh, meetings. I'm using my time to address potential issues that may result in my property being in an uninhabitable, damaged, or result in loss of value due to our 
county employees and elected supervisors allowing the construction of this project, identified as Humboldt Wind LLC conditional use permit, and I won't go into the numbers because of time. Um, I believe the environmental impact report to be incomplete and inadequate for a project of this size and scope. The, this statement is being made for my properties located 1172 Monument Road, Riodale, California, and 2501 Monument Road, Riodale, California, and any other property owned by me, my husband, or my heirs, and is three pages in length. I have serious concerns about distributing the size, disturbing the seismic active ground in the general area designated by this project. I cannot be more specific on location as the county has not mandated that individual turbine locations be identified and related engineering completed for environmental review. Groundwater quality due to site preparation, drilling and ongoing operations, fire destructions from falling structures, failing equipment and ongoing operations, property value reduction, misuse enlar um, enlargement of the county road known as Monument Road that runs through my 2501 Monument Road property by employees, their contractors, equipment vendors or guests of the project, fire destruction due to high voltage lines running through the project site and transmission lines continuing to Bridgeville, electrical pollution, animal loss due to increased predators displayed, displaced by traditional habitat destruction, damage resulting from aircraft spraying after impact, diminished quality of life, health concerns for myself, my guests, and any future residents caused by air quality, shadow flicker, which is the strobe light effect, shadowing, night lighting, vibration, audible, non-audible, low frequency noise, electrical pollution. I am um, I am including this point for my fellow Humboldt County residents that may not be aware of the process. Loss of revenue. Thank you. I have the 14 copies required. You can give them to the clerk, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I get more time? Let me finish. I thought I had to stop. Yep. Okay, um, I am including this point for my fellow Humboldt County residents. Loss of revenue due to aesthetic change in the ambience of Humboldt County. I look forward to utilizing my time on November 17th to address my specific concerns resulting from review of the final environmental impact report. And then I provided the copies. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Tom Wheeler. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental Protection Information Center, or EPIC. Um, I am also a staff attorney. Um, I, I think I share the same passion for environmental and impact analysis as Melanie, and as Melanie is likely to tell her class to approve a project that would result in significant environmental impacts, you first need to exhaust all feasible mitigation measures. Uh, determinations of feasibility are not left to the project applicant, but rests with the county. You have to make the decision of feasibility. Um, as Planning Director Ford said, this project is going to require those statements of overriding consideration because of the significant impacts of this project that the county asserts cannot be mitigated below levels of significance. Uh, staff has broadly outlined what these impacts are. Um, and EPIC is disappointed because we, we fundamentally disagree. We believe that there are things that are left on the table that could be implemented in this project that would significantly reduce the operational impact of this project. So for example, one of these mitigation measures is called smart curtailment. And this is something that we can do to prevent wildlife impacts. It was not incorporated into the project because in the FEIR, the county found that this mitigation measure was apparently not economically and technologically feasible. Uh, as Director Ford, admitted earlier in this meeting, however, this is apparently not based on any sort of accounting, but on the vermins of the project proponents. That seems to be the basis for rejecting this particular mitigation measure. This conclusion is particularly hard to justify because this is a mitigation measure that is imposed at other wind projects across North America. Um, it is commercially available technology. Uh, this is all within the record. This is the substantial evidence that is within the record that this is a feasible mitigation measure that can and should be employed for this project. And legally, the county must employ it. Um, if this, this uh, I, I also want to address an, an earlier speaker raised that this is a, a site, site class uh, three, which the California Department of Fish and Wildlife calls uh, high or uncertain impacts to wildlife. So that's what the county has determined. What the California Department of Fish and Wildlife determined, well, this is uh, site class four. Uh, and the 
the official title of site class four sites are project sites inappropriate for wind development. I'm not saying that we should not de develop this project, but we should develop a project that includes all of those mitigation measures that are economically feasible. We need to reduce the impact of this project as much as we can. We owe it to ourselves. We owe it to the wildlife. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Frank Basic, and then the next three will be Ari Friedland, David Sampson, and Meg Stofsky, if I pronounced that right. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, Mr. Director, staff. Hello. My name is Frank Basic. I'm the president, and I direct the legal affairs of the little town of Scotia. Scotia is, along with the Wiat tribe, ground zero to the environmental impacts that will result from this project. And in our opinion, it's a browner project than has been recited here. It'll have all kinds of impacts, the half dozen or more of which will be significant, adverse, unmitigated, and s supposedly unavoidable. W Scotia is going to be mostly impacted by this uh, juncture of heavy equipment that's uh, going to be putting out uh, oxides of nitrogen. Scotia is going to be impacted most uh, more than any other community by the uh, aesthetic impacts of having uh, these windmills on our uh, scenic vista. When you, if you've come to Scotia, you know the, the, the thing that predominates and grabs your attention is uh, Monument Ridge and Bear River Ridge. They loom immediately above our town. They're what we see in the morning. They're, they're where we look to find out if it snowed the night before. Uh, sun sets over these, uh, this ridge, and it's just miles from uh, the town of Scotia. Now, everybody who lives in Scotia has, uh, is either one of our tenants or has recently purchased a home from us. We're in the business of improving and marketing property there, and we can't help but feel that this will have an impact if it's developed on those property values. We have obtained through a lengthy EIR a subdivision uh, entitlement for our town so that we can uh, take these little homes and split them up into uh, reasonable lots and, and sell them to people. Um, uh, but uh, we've got to attract folks to come and buy them. And in order to uh, get that subdivision approved, the county insisted that we agree to the implementation of special zoning regulations uh, applicable to Scotia only that protect its historic integrity. We can't build a house or put a porch on or even tear down a building that's been gutted by fire unless we comply with this historical resource protection zoning code provisions. And yet we're talking about putting uh, the, the, uh, on the landscape, our scenic vista, this uh, set of space age fans. There, there, <laughs> We, we, we've, we've sent you comments, and you'll get more detailed comments, but there are two things I want to mention about the EIR. One is these significant impacts can probably be mitigated in, in some ways, and many ways were suggested, um, but there are still, from the very beginning to the very end, there's been no change whatsoever in the categorization of the impacts, significant, adverse, and unmitigated. Usually a couple of those would kill your project, and in this instance, there's a half dozen and more, and we're talking about overriding considerations that haven't even been disclosed to the public to, to justify and explain why those overriding, uh, why the uh, significant impacts will be overridden. So thank you very much. We are opposing the project. We stand in solidarity with the, uh, the Wiat tribe and with uh, the Scotia Community Services District, the Scotia Volunteer Fire Department, and in, in accord with their comments, the, uh, the city of Rio Dell. They're here tonight, I'll let them speak for themselves, but all of these local communities that are the most impacted are against this project. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, uh, <coughs> the next uh, three were, were Ari, David, and Meg. Hi. And, and I, let, let me explain the light system. The green light, I believe you have uh, uh, up till uh, two minutes and, and uh, 45 seconds, then the orange you have 15, and then the red, your three minutes is up. And we've got a lot of people to go through. I've got a, I've got a big list, so uh, okay. please uh, uh, be considerate of the people behind you. Thank you, go ahead, speaker. 
Uh, I'll be brief as, but as I can. My name is Allie Friedland with an L, not an R. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, it was not the first time it was a made a mistake. Um, so this was an amazing um, plan. It's all sharp and, um, and it seemed like it got all the impacts that um, mitigated and I really appreciate that it went from 60 down to 47. And I really appreciate it because it was from the Marble Mural at Flyway. Um, but I, I want to point out that the hard sell that Nathan was giving you all, it actually really um, depressed me that he said, oh, we met with all the stakeholders and we wanted to avoid the Matoll. As if it was the Matoll over Bear River. I just want to say that because there was never any discussion. I went to three meetings, some privately and some with the Salmon Group um, and some as a community meeting where it was never uh, an, uh, even on the docket that the Matoll, the Long Ridge or the Rainbow Ridge might be considered. We never heard about that at all. So we had no, we did not have any sway over no Matoll. I just want to say that because it almost sounded like we chose Bear River over Matoll and that was not the case. Um, and so I was pretty disturbed by that characterization. Um, and it also as, um, an earlier speaker said, made me want to um, th rethink what he was saying about other things. So um, the main reason I came today, I really wanted to like the WIN project from the beginning, and I kept trying to, and it, the impacts just kept being so big. And um, I'll get to some of the things that I that immediately took it off for me as I studied it. But just recently, if, if the PSPS, PG&E shutdowns haven't changed your mind about what we need here, we need more microgrids. I do have solar panels, and I'm sorry, Larry Goldberg, but mine only cost 16000 and I was having a fine time. And so there are ways to have other kinds of community energy. And... Um, I just feel like we can't keep going back into a grid that is going to get shut down. That is the new normal now. I want to say that the wildfire is an issue. I've been out to Humboldt Redwood Company land more than times I can count on my hand. They don't cut all the underbrush. I'm sorry, they get to it when they have a timber harvest plan and the rest is all dense. It is not it is not just cleared out as if it's going to be waiting. And then the last thing, one of your hmm, one of your questions is what happens when they leave in 30 years? I was told they take the things down and they leave the cement pads there forever. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. David or Meg? Prompt you here because I, uh, many thoughts are, have occurred. One of the terms that we just uh, <coughs> hello and thank you, thank you especially Melanie and Peggy. Uh, this is a conflict. This has generated a conflict in our community that was designed to be toxic, because in the past, in the old days, the conflict was between the environmentalists and let's say the loggers. The ranchers, that's not true anymore. Now the conflict is within the, the environmental community itself. So what are the, what are the, what are the, uh, I can't read my handwriting. <laughs> what are the, the uh, shared values of our community? What really, let's get down to it. And I hate to say this because the concept is useful, but in this case is being badly abused. Why is, this being, why is this called clean energy? The impacts of this, these windmills is, is tremendous. And it's not just confined to Rainbow Ridge, or I mean, pardon me, to Bear River Ridge and Monument Ridge. So it doesn't classify as clean energy. And last, I'm, I'm going to be quick here. Uh, when, when, these project, when this project was first announced, we, we were told that there were going to be 60 windmills uh, and that they were going to provide the 
power to to uh, fuel 32,000 households in Humboldt County. How did it come to be that now there are 47 windmills, and I heard the figure tonight of 70,000 households. So there's some sleight of hand going on here, and I suggest that everybody be aware of the fact that uh, we we are we are helpless. We don't have we don't have the science ourselves. We're at the mercy of the science of the of the proponent of the project, and I think that's uh, puts us in a dangerous situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, and after Meg, we will have Kit Mann, Renata Laughlin, and Nick Zeburn. Zeburn, and I hope I haven't butchered the names too bad, poorly. Good evening. Uh, my name is Meg Stofsky. I was at the presentation last night and again tonight, and I'm acknowledging that I am on stolen Wiat land. I'm here to voice solidarity with the Wiat tribe against this particular wind energy project on this particular site. After everything that we have heard today, um, I, how can the board vote? You don't have the information. You haven't given it to the community, and there's a week before then you're going to vote on it? Uh-uh. That's just smoke and mirrors, people. Um, I, I true, it sounds like it's a done deal, and I truly hope it is not. The arguments for this project are typical capitalist colonizer rationales, i.e., the Chamber of Commerce is for it because there's going to be 300 construction jobs, which are probably not going to go to local people, after which there may be 30 jobs for people for the lifespan of these monstrous blades. This is insanity. The depictions presented today themselves illustrate why there is no justification for the proposed destruction of the land, generating killer winds from the skies that will kill and destroy bats, condors, owls, as well as sacred land, sacred stolen land. How can that even be, how can you people be considering this when you know that the Wiat tribe is against it for all the reasons all of the costs, not just the economic ones, the ones that you can't buy, which you're trying to, makes me ill. The short-term gains with lasting destructive impact. Nothing can justify the site proposed for this uh, project, which was rated for by the California Fish and Wildlife, totally unsuitable. I implore the board, I implore you all to vote against it, and I'm or the board to vote against it, do not show the same lack of respect for the Wiat tribe's knowledge and wishes. They did this a lot better than we. We have failed, absolutely failed, to be stewards of the land. Do not demonstrate the lack of respect of tri tribe's knowledge and wishes and the same capitalist colonizer mentality and actions that are effectively destroying Mother Earth. Do not authorize this over their objections. No, no, no. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, hold the applause, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kit Mann. I live in Blue Lake. And um, actually, I've been uh, working on solar energy and energy conservation since the mid-70s. Uh, I've known Larry for that long. I have solar on my own house. I drive an electric car. I'm a lifelong environmentalist. But there is just one overriding environmental imperative on this planet right now, and it's to decarbonize the atmosphere. And the reason that's the imperative is because if we don't solve that, and on the emergency basis that 11,000 scientists, and every scientist that deals with climate change has ever told us, is that all the rest of these things become moot. We, we, we lose all these things. We're, we're not just talking about a few birds' mortality. We're talking about species mortality. We are talking about impacts that are far beyond what most of us can even imagine. Everything else has to take a back seat to decarbonizing the atmosphere. And wind is one of the best ways to do it. Solar is also there. Hydro is there. Heck, if you listen to some people, not me, nuclear is there. But we've got to stop putting carbon in the atmosphere. And this will be an, you know, the climate crisis is going to be an equal opportunity disaster. 
And with due and sincere respect, it's not going to care who our ancestors are or how long we've lived here. It will affect everyone on the planet. And I include all my relations. That's all the creatures below the sea, in the air, on the ground, all the plants, everybody. We are all going to make sacrifices in the future. We can make some of those now where we have a modicum of control, ability to make some mitigations to defer some of the impacts. Or we can make those sacrifices in 15 or 20 or 50 or 100 years when we have no control whatsoever and it's all gotten very, very ugly. They've done a fabulous job, I think, the staff and the project manager in trying to handle some of those mitigations. Who among us would take a 22% cut in our salary? Who among us would, would uh, you know, pay 22% more in our utility bills? Not many. We're admonished that we should be considering seven generations. It won't take seven generations. Our children's children will know whether we made the right choice here. They will know whether we stepped up and worked hard to try and make their world, their atmosphere, cleaner to avoid this bleak and unhappy future we will need not one Terrigen project, but thousands all over the world. We can get started now and here. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Good evening. My name is Nick Sobern. Um, I want to point out that one acre of old growth redwood trees can store a million, cubic, uh, million metric tons of carbon. So the main thing this county is doing wrong is cutting the redwood trees over and over and over. Those would be able to absorb a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. If people want everything to burn down, then keep cutting down the redwood trees. They want to cut uh, 600 or 900 acres of redwoods to do this. and want have it's, it's not clean energy, it's dirty energy. It's, it's very dirty to cut down the forest to do this, and uh, of course the lumber company thinks that's the right thing to do, but it's not. As far as a fire hazard, the uh, lumber company has um, hack and squirt herbicided a lot of uh, monument ridge. There's a lot of uh, dead trees, all the oak trees, every timber harvest plant or beside all their oak and madrone trees, and there's just acres and there's there's acres and acres and acres of dead trees standing on that ridge. And then the windmills are going to be in these uh, meadows that are dry during the summer. If there's a fire, there those meadows are very dry, very just going to catch on fire. And then there's I don't know how many acres, but a lot of acres of dead standing trees. Mendocino County has passed a law with 62% of the vote against leaving the dead standing trees, but the lumber company is still refusing to uh, to remove those. And it's a big fire hazard that that law was passed by a fire chief in Mendocino County who's very concerned about the fire hazard. It's called Measure V. Um, then another thing is that there's a lot of residual old growth redwood trees out there in the forest. A lot of them are alongside of uh, streams, embankments uh, that the lumber company is not allowed to cut within 50 feet or something like that of the streams, depending on the size of the streams. Uh, so there's a lot of old residual old growth, and uh, I think they're going to cut old growth trees because they have. Um, the, they they cut uh, they will cut old growth trees to build roads and that's part of their habitat conservation plan even though they claim that they don't cut any but then there are also this I would really look into whether Terrigen is exempt from the habitat conservation plan because just because they're not the same company as an alarm company 
they're, do, they're just leasing the land. So it's happening on the lumber company's land. I don't think that they even have a legal right to say that they're exempt. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, next speaker, uh, is, if I've got it right, is uh, Renata Laughlin. Renata, Renata Laughlin. Well, and if <laughs> the next three, Chris Namella, Ellen Taylor, and Jeffrey Hedden. Good evening. Um, my concerns lie with the inadequacies of the bird surveys. We're all familiar with the saying, garbage in, garbage out. Well, I'm going to be blunt. I believe that the methods used to conduct these bird surveys are basically garbage. So the results are garbage. Those surveys were, were greatly inadequate. Um, and you can't properly measure the impacts if you're using inadequate survey data. I don't care how good a statistician you are. For example, the Eagle surveys, they did one hour of survey once per month. One hour once per month. I thought that was some kind of joke. The, the bird surveys were done, the small bird surveys were done within an 800 meter radius circular plot. When was the last time you were able to see and identify a small bird half a mile away? Um, so the results from these meager surveys are basically meaningless and should be unacceptable, and yet they're still running analysis on this meager data. Um, they should actually be embarrassed to call themselves statisticians. Again, you cannot honestly estimate potential impacts on inadequate data. So I moved up to this area 25 years ago to study birds and ecology at HSU, and uh, especially raptors. One of my favorite places to go was Bear River Ridge. I could go up there and see I'm just the, the pure numbers and diversity of birds, of raptors up there. There is bald eagles, golden eagles, red-tailed hawks, ferruginous hawks, peregrine falcons, prairie falcons, merlins, kestrels, Cooper's hawks, sharp-shinned hawks. It was basically raptor heaven. Um, the high numbers and diversity is not surprising because that whole area lies within the Pacific Flyway migration route. So hundreds of thousands of birds fly that route in spring and fall migration. The grasslands and the open woodlands provide prime foraging habitat for these migrating and wintering raptors. Um, there are so many raptors that pass through this area. In fact, researchers at one time thought of opening a migration station. So basically, two simple reasons why I believe this project should not move forward. Poor survey methodology, which grossly underestimates the eagle use of this area and thus underestimates the mortality rates. I'll say it again, you simply cannot properly estimate impacts using inadequate data. Number two, poor project location. Erecting wind turbines in prime foraging habitat within the Pacific Flyway, Flyway ensures high mortality rates. The only way to ensure a reduction in bird deaths associated with this project is to not build it in a migration flyway. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Good evening, my name is Ellen Taylor and I'm a member of the Pacific Alliance for Indigenous and Environmental Action and also the chairperson for the Lost Coast League. Um, people who have been critics of this program have been called NIMBY. Um, I think that's a true statement in that the whole of the planet is our backyard and in 2019 we have to regard it as such. The wind farm proposed for Humboldt County appears at first glance to be a Sophie's Choice situation. Pursuing our state obligation to reduce greenhouse gases by 60% in the next five years, or try to protect our unique redwood, dug fir, and prairie habitat together with its embattled wildlife population. The Sophie's Choice analogy falls apart at closer inspection. California is a small part of the world's greenhouse gas generating surface. 
Terrigen is a subsidiary of Energy Capital Partners. Some of the other subsidiaries are Fury, Operating Alaska, Targa Resources, Triton Power Par Partners, U.S. Development Group, Summit Midstream Partners, U.S. Gulf Coast, Coast Development Opportunities, and more. Um, what will be the broader environmental effects of this project, which will ultimately affect us? This is not a clean energy. Numerous of energy capital partners, other subsidiaries, mine back and shale, build crude oil terminals, pipelines, offshore platforms in Alaska, engage in fracking. They all look for opportunities to expand, and the climate for this is favorable under current administrations. The fossil fuel industry has had its most profitable years during the last three decades. Worldwide increased greenhouse gas production will be the likely result of our tidy response to California's challenge. The, temp the dilemma turns out to look more like a Hurwitz takeover, the results of which we have had lots of experience, culminating in loss. It's predatory industrial expansion over which we will have little control once it starts. The result of this adventure, however, will have more catastrophic effects as California burns and low-lying countries go under. Um, Please listen to the WIATs, and let's build bike trails, bus lines, carpools, and solar, and turn away from exploitation to developing real routes ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, next uh, is Jeffrey, and then the following will have Carol Hoops, Penny Whitehead, and Nate Matson. I think I have to lift, lift this up. Is this working? Okay, I'm Jeff Hedin, and I am concerned that in all of the environmental analyses that I've been able to read, no one has really looked at the wind and what effect this project will have on the wind itself. Now, there are lots of types of winds that we experience. We have the cyclonic winds coming down from the Gulf of Alaska. We have offshore breezes, we have onshore breezes, we have what are now being called atmospheric rivers. And there is one ri wind that comes over these ridges that is sort of an atmospheric stream. And it's a very important stream in its downstream effects on our environment, particularly on the redwood forests in the canyons of the Eel River. And every afternoon, not quite every afternoon, there are still afternoons, but basically all summer long, there is a sea wind that comes in and up these canyons. And this wind is carrying as much water as it is possible for 60 to 70 degree air to hold. And it comes in, and you can see it going up over Monument Ridge sometimes in the summer days, and you see this little cloud that we call a lentil cloud. That little cloud is actually a spot where this breeze is being lifted into a high enough altitude that the water condenses briefly going over this spot. Now that load of water comes in and it fills the canyons of the Eel River. And any of you who have been out canoeing or floating a raft down these rivers know that in a late afternoon on a hot summer day, you can hardly paddle a canoe or row a, um, an inflatable raft against this breeze. And if you start to watch it, as I have, living there and taking care of our parks, etc., that the redwood forest is actually defined by the area in which this load of water in the late fall, when the evenings are cool enough, condenses into a ground fog. And that ground fog is as flat as a lake. And the redwood trees do not grow where that fog does not sit. And I think we need to know 
what these machines, these big whirling machines, are going to do to that breeze that comes in in the afternoons. Now perhaps we could shut them down for that breeze and keep this forest, but these machines are not going to take carbon out of the atmosphere. That needs photosynthesis. And this forest is a prime photosynthesizing entity. And we should take very good care of it, stimulate it, and it's probably the best thing we can do to reduce carbon in the atmosphere and hold this planet livable forever. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. <clears throat> I'm going to take a right turn here. My name is Carol Hoops. I live at 2330 Monument Road, Riedel. Humboldt County Planning, <coughs> good evening, excuse me, Humboldt County Planning Commission and Director Ford. As a resident of Humboldt County at 2330 Monument Road, Riedel, two miles from the Humboldt Wind Project, basically ground zero, conditional use and special permit applications, I have a couple of points of interest which I request clarification for, basically from Director Ford, if you will, please. The first point of interest is what aspects of the Humboldt Wind LLC conditional use and special use permits has allowed for any start of work on Monument or Bear River Ridges. I have witnessed additional vehicle use on Monument, such as, of course, Stantec, who's done the studies, but I've also witnessed um, construction cranes being walked up an S-turn below my driveway because the trailer and the truck hauling it couldn't pull it up through the S-turn. That's why they're using Jordan Creek Road. Um, is the county monitoring construction on the private property of Humboldt Redwood and Russ Ranches? Director Ford, yeah, direct, have you started? Direct your questions to the uh, chair, uh, chair you, that's who you are. I'm sorry, I was asking for clarifications. Yeah, I can't well, ask the staff yeah, for clarifications. You can ask the question. Staff will take your question down, but we're not going to get into a debate here. On okay, the I'm not debate. asking for a debate. I just no, want right. clarifications because I, I wanted to know if okay. there has been start of project on Monument and Bear River Ridges due to the increase in traffic okay, well you on can, Monument Road. Yeah. <clears throat> My second point of contention or interest I started thinking about it. Um, the well-promoted tax dollars that the County of Humboldt will receive from the completion of this project, Terrigen has flaunted their future contribution to the county as the second largest taxpayer in Humboldt, from up to $2 million to $2.5 million. Are these property taxes? From what I saw tonight on Terrigen's slide, they said that, so, uh, that wind power pays property taxes, solar does not. So my question is, does the money the county gets, is that from property taxes? And then my second question is, will the property values for these private lands be increased depending on the number of turbines approved? Or will there be a power generated tax placed on Humboldt residents? If the RCEA negotiates a power purchase agreement with Terrigen, will the residents of Humboldt be given the right to vote on utility taxes? This is a question I don't know. The tax issue is complicated as the values will fluctuate depending on number of turbines and or power generation. Unlike tax dollars, Terrigen has presented over and over. And I have copies to be submitted for record. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. P Penny or Nate? Penny or Nate, are you still here? Penny Whitehead, Nate Madsen. Obviously not Penny Whitehead, but Nate Madsen. Uh, commissioners. Uh, director, staff, proponents, I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate your time and attention, and I know that this is a difficult issue, and I'm really glad that we're taking the time to think about it before implementing or not implementing. Um, because this is a difficult topic and a difficult project to assess, I just need to come out right in front and say I am opposed to this project. I am strongly opposed to this project. 
Now, how did I come to that decision? That was a very difficult decision to make because we have, as Larry and Kit pointed out, an extreme climate crisis that we have to deal with. So, and I was speaking to Nathan out in the hall and he said, well, if not this, then what? Totally valid questions. Like, we're at a crux, we gotta do something. But how often in human history have we said, oh my God, we have to do something, and then we do something stupid? I, don't, I hope we don't do that in this instance. This is too precious a location. This, to quote David Simpson, I was really glad he went before me because I was afraid I might steal his thunder, but to quote him, he said to me at one point, he says, you know, this is the wrong project for all the right reasons. And it really kind of comes down to that. It's like, yes, we have to do something, but what are we going to do? And I think we should start being the proponents of energy infill, just like we are for development infill. We should be talking about rooftop solar in Eureka, Arcata, McKinleyville, et cetera. I look out the window of my office, and I see acres of unoccupied rooftops. And I'd like to see us fill those with solar. And if the individuals who own those rooftops aren't going to do it, I'd like to see our uh, county government step in and give incentives for that. And maybe we just pay for it. Just pay for the project and make it back later with the energy that's produced. You know, we, we could come out ahead pretty quick that way, I think. I also think we can be a lot more creative than this. I think we could uh, implement uh, micro hydro rooftop <coughs> energy production that, you know, could also be a big part of meeting our energy demand without sacrificing the ridge tops. These are some, inc I mean, if you, if you know these ridge tops, Personally, there is a good chance you would be in, against this project. I mean, they are that precious. And so I, um, I implore you guys to consider the impacts, uh, to consider the uh, comments of the WIAT, and to oppose this project. Thank you, Speaker. Did Penny show up yet? Penny Whitehead? If not, the next three, Angelina <coughs> Lasco, Joan Tippetts and Jeff Hunterbach. Hello, everyone. Um, I just found out about this project, and I just want to let you guys know that I am completely opposed to this. Um, I agree with some of the things that I've heard from people today that this is um, not the project that's in the best interest of Humboldt. And I think a lot of the speakers today have already told you guys why. Um, I think we need to be supporting more local microgrid, um, just like the speaker before me was talking about having the, why can't the county come up with their own project, with their own finances, with their own budget, and the county and us taxpayers pay for it, and we have a return come back. We want to talk about creating jobs. 15 jobs isn't that much in Humboldt County. But having a job that's through the city that gives me health benefits and retirement, that's a job that I'm looking for. How do we know under these 15 jobs that he's going to hire people in Humboldt County and not people from out of, the, out of the state or out of the county? He's a company that is in multiple states. Um, we don't need big corporate energy. We need to think of a solution. And we don't need to act just because we don't want to be with PG&E right now. Um, I think we're all having that tension and um, clear-cutting our forest, putting cement on our forest ground. The soils is the second carbon sink before trees. So having degraded soils is even bigger. Um, Shively Ridge, you know, driving that road, that road is falling apart. I've been driving it for a couple years now every single day, multiple times a day. I had it shut down and the county told me they didn't have a dozer to even fix it because they don't have the money to fix it. So whose responsibility is to, to maintain these roads? Um, me, my taxpaying dollars, whose? Um, there's so much wrong with this project. I think it was written really fast. I think a lot of it was pushed really fast to go through. And I would like to see the people that I know personally, the people that I know that are speaking for the community members, to say this isn't the project that's for Humboldt County, that we have clear land that can be used. What about, what about alternative wind energy that's newer wind energy? What about using turbineless wind energy, ones that don't even spin, that pivot? There are so many new technologies coming out. Does this project give us that flexibility? Because um, I don't think it does. 
I think having more support, you know, I know the city of Arcata is talking about alternatives. They want to be completely independent of energy. So there are way, we could be more creative and we can use our resources that we have here to create something for ourselves. And we don't need a big corporate company coming and telling us what we need or what, how we wanted to do it. Um, I don't understand why the Bridgeport uh, substation is being used and not the Rio Dell. Um, according to the California uh, Energy Commission, there's maps showing transmission lines, substations, and you can see that there's two in Rio Dell. One is probably from private lim timber. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker. Um, I'm here on behalf of the California Native Plant Society this evening. As, um, next week you'll probably see me wearing my own hat. Um, <clears throat> but um, I'm here because I dropped off um, a packet of 14 copies and an original um, to show that um, we submitted um, a letter to, um, in response to the draft EIR that was not ever um, incorporated into the documents. It does not appear um, in the final EIR and was never, the, the specific um, <clears throat> issues that we brought up were not addressed. Some of them, of course, were addressed because they were also brought up by others. But um, I just um, want to let you know that, that that was overlooked and that we're concerned about that and that we feel that that's an indication that perhaps this, um, another indication that this um, project is being um, perhaps rushed through a little bit more than it should be. And um, hopefully you have the copies that I gave them to one of the officers that was here. What's Joan Tippetts. All right, so that's, yeah. that's it for me for, for, for this evening. Thank you for, thank you for listening. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, and the following three, uh, I can hardly read this, Aaron Roll, Aaron Rolf, Alan Conter, and Geneva Thompson. So, anyway, Jeff, is there a Jeff Hunterbach? No Jeff? Okay. Then Geneva, Adam, or I think it's Aaron with an E, I believe. Ocio, Iaqui, and good afternoon or good evening, uh, Chair, Commissioners, and Director. My name is Geneva E. B. Thompson, and I am the Associate General Counsel for the Yurok Tribe, and I'm also a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I would like to acknowledge that we are in Wiat land, and I want to thank the Wiat Tribe for inviting representatives of the Yurok Tribe here tonight. I am also here to express the Yurok Tribe's support of our neighbors, the Wiat Tribe and the Yurok Tribe's opposition to this project. We oppose this project because the FEIR has failed to provide the adequate mit mitigation measures to avoid the significant impacts to Wiat cultural resources, cultural landscapes, and the California condors. And we find that this failure to provide these mitigation measures is in violation of CEQA. First, the project uh, the, of the wind turbines will have a significant impact on the Bear River Ridge. Bear River Ridge is a sacred high prayer spot for the Wiat people and is an ethno-botanical cultural landscape where traditionally and culturally significant plants grow. The Wiat tribe has made it very clear that this project will harm their cultural landscapes, cultural resources, and cultural lifeways. Threats on cultural resources against native nations and its people is a threat against all Native nations and all Native people's cultural resources. Further, the Humboldt Wind Energy Project will have significant impacts on the California condor, which is an endangered species. The Wiat and Yurok people consider the condor a sacred animal. The condor has been spiritually tied to Yurok ceremonies since the beginning of the world. 
Its feathers are used and its songs are sung in the world renewal ceremonies in which the Yurok people pray and fast to balance the world. The condor features are very prominent in Yurok stories, dances, and particularly the white deerskin dance. Because of the cultural significance of the condor, the Yurok tribe's wildlife program has been working tirelessly over a decade to develop and implement a program to establish reintroduce population of California condors in northern coast region. This reintroduced population of California condors will contribute to the overall recovery of the species. The Humboldt Wind Energy Project and its risks of killing newly introduced California condors will not only be a potential violation of the Endangered Species Act, but will significantly hinder the Yurok condor program. For these reasons, we feel that more extensive consideration of potential take of future California condors with the proposed project area should be considered and adequate mitigation measures adopt, adopted to avoid significant harms to the California condors. The Arc Tribe understands the importance of finding green renewable energy as a step to decarbonizing Humboldt and addressing the causes of today's climate crisis. But new projects and programs addressing the climate crisis must be completed in a way that's inclusive and addresses environmental justice concerns. Projects destroying Wiat and Yurok cultural resources not, and cultural landscapes uh, perpetuates colonization and therefore is not an environmentally just outcome or solution to our climate crisis. Um, very quickly, I want to say that I know that the Humboldt County Planning Commission understands and respects the importance of cultural resources and the protection of cultural resources for Native people. We've worked together in the past uh, on protection of cultural resources, and the York Tribe wants to thank you for your partnership. And we hope that you will, uh, during this meeting and the 14th, will consider the significant impacts of the Humboldt Wind Energy Project on we at cultural resources, cultural landscapes, and the sacred California corridors. And um, we oppose this project, and we hope you do as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm Adam Cantor, a natural resources specialist with the Wiat Tribe. Um, hello, commissioners, Director Ford. And uh, you know, no one that's up here, um, I hope everyone knows the tribe opposes the project at this time due to all of its significant impacts. No one up here arguing against this project wants to be arguing against a renewable energy project. We're up here because we have to. That This site is super sacred. It's very significant biologically, um, ecologically, culturally. And no one wants, wants to be up here. We're all up here because um, we have to. And you know, the first thing with this project is, is the environmental documents are just completely inadequate. Um, it's, it's a huge area. And you know one of the biggest questions is the siting of the turbines. We do not know the exact siting of the turbines. How can we evaluate the impacts if we don't know the siting of the turbines? Um, I, I brought my prop in here. The, this green binder, it's not the FEIR. This is just the cultural resource uh, report for the project area. It is literally scattered with artifacts. So when the company says they're going to avoid um, archaeological sites, you know, we'll believe it when we see it. There's going to have to be cultural monitors up there, but, but the project's not going to happen, so we won't have to have them up there. Um, and, and just for example, um, uh, 83 different plant communities were identified within this project area. It's an ecological transect that goes from the coastal headlands of Cape Mendocino through our various mixed forest types. Mixed forest types hold more carbon than monotypic forest stands all the way um, to the oak woodlands and grasslands of Bridgeville. It, it's, a, it's a very biodiverse um, area. Out of these 81 communities, 38 are sensitive or rare in the state. That's 50% of the vegetation types are unique and rare within this project area. And you know, I will say um, the tribe was quite offended by um, the mitigation, a suggestion that the tribe would be offered uh, 300 plants uh, from impacts in the ethnobotanical area. That's about one for every um, Wiat killed at the Tulawat massacre. Not even one for every living tribal member. Um, also, um, one of the mitigations for Golden Eagle deaths is $600 um, donation to the Wildlife Care Center. This does not seem appropriate or respectful. Um, uh, 
finally, um, uh, the gentleman that talked about um, the fog dynamics completely left out from the environmental review is the effect on um, humidity and fog. Research has shown that turbines reduce the humidity and dry out soils downwind from the turbine sites. What's downwind from these turbines? Humboldt Redwood State Park. Grizzly Creek, Pamplin Grove, Cheatham Grove. These groves, hum old growth redwood forest stores more carbon than any other forest type in the world, including the Amazon. If a turbine or a um, genti a related fire breaks out and we jeopardize the lungs of the Pacific Northwest in these forests, that is our biggest contribution to fighting the global climate crisis is through forest protection and landscape preservation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Aaron R R Rolf, if I'm reading this right, no Aaron, Christopher West, Annie Knight, and Rick Pelgrin. Christopher West, Annie Knight, and Rick Pelgrin. Hello, uh, I'd like to thank the commission for uh, having us here to present to you today. Uh, I'm Chris West, the senior wildlife biologist of the Yurok tribe and uh, the lead of their Northern California condor reintroduction project. I would also like to acknowledge the Wiat tribe and thank them for hosting us on their ancestral territory this evening. Um, as Geneva said previously, the Yurok tribe does oppose this project. Um, I have been working on condor conservation for over, tw over 20 years and have some experience with their biology and conservation strategies. I understand that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service intend to designate the reintroduction project that we're spearheading um, as 10J under the Endangered Species Act. Um, this, this denotes it as a non-essential experimental population. Um, this is, however, not set uh, because we are still undergoing the NEPA process on this project, and so therefore, since this action is still ongoing, um, this has not been set as a non-essential population at this time. Hence, a 10J determination um, and incidental take associated with it and allowances are not a foregone conclusion. Therefore, take on this proposed population is still a possibility and has not been addressed in the, the proposal before you. Those proposing this project have suggested that the use of a geofence or automatic shutdown system, as has been used in Southern California, um, is an adequate mitigation for this project. However, we don't yet know what the mortality risks for California condors are up here. We haven't re reintroduced any condors as of yet. Um, so what if the risks are very low? Well, we may want to relax tracking requirements um, that we have used in other places. Maybe we don't want to put transmitters on all the birds. Maybe we don't want to have to go to those measures or we want to relax them sometime sooner than the 20 year time span of our project that we intend to, uh, to undertake up here. If a geofence is, place, is in place to protect birds from a large turbine project, we'll be obli obligated to maintain this heavy handed management and we'll lose flexibility in our management practices regardless of what is best for condors. Our plan currently calls for, as I mentioned, a 20-year management project, and if all goes well, we, we may be able to go hands-off at that time. With this being a 30-year project and 10 years left uh, in the, the maintenance of the turbines, who is going to continue monitoring, tagging, trapping, and all the other actions required for the additional 10 years? This will cost at minimum an additional $5 million, a huge cost if deemed unnecessary at that time. Um, so just some, some points I wanted to lay out before the commission. Again, I want to thank you, and uh, again, thank the Weot Tribe for hosting us on their ancestral territory. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Ani or Rick? Ani or Rick? <clears throat>
Chairman. <clears throat> the FEIR specifies plans to reduce raptor mortality by poisoning or otherwise killing off rodents on the project site. I have all the chapter and verse here, but I won't read it at, in this public meeting, but it is on my submitted documents. Uh, so, uh, poisoning the rodents. Uh, this will result in the death of raptors due to starvation, deaths of upper food chain predators like a fox, bobcat, mountain lion, and others, will result in the total disruption of the food chain and a catastrophic failure of the ecosystem on Monument and Bear River Ridge. It's a no-brainer, including the raptors. So what they're trying to protect, now they're going to kill by, by ruining the ecosystem. Makes a lot of sense. The applicant has done no evaluation on the effects of poisoning in this manner upon the ecosystem. The FEIR is inadequate on this issue. The FEIR also specifies plants to spray project areas with poisonous chemicals that will inhibit growth of plants. Again, the applicant has done no evaluation on the effects of defoliants upon the ecosystem. The FEIR is inadequate on this issue. The FEIR states that significant cultural resources have been found in Bridgeville. They weren't reported to the state, and they figure there's no need to tell anybody about it. They're just going to pave it over. The applicant proposes diverting untreated industrial wastewater from HRC's cogen facility in Scotia, and when it's not permitted by the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. Additionally, the FEIR is inadequate due to the fact that it states that their water will be taken from the Scotia Pond and then turns around and another section states that it will be purchased from HRC taken from the effluent from the Scotia Cogen facility. The FAA required lighting on WTGs will be a public nuisance, especially to the historic town of Scotia, which is listed as a state uh, historic area. Wintertime operations violate HRC's HCP. The lead agency abused their discretion in deciding that applicant does not have to abide by the HCP. Therefore, the FEIR is inadequate on this issue. Applicant proposes a new well at the O&M facility. The applicant states that this is potable water used only at this facility. That's a lie. The applicant will probably try to load water trucks using the well as a source. This appears to be an SB 1262 issue. Additionally, the FEIR is inadequate on this issue since it doesn't, does not state the location of the five-acre parcel uh, to be used for the O&M facility, nor has there been a groundwater survey done at the site of the proposed well. There are too many unmitigated impacts, again, ignored, because these definitions are within the purview of the Humboldt County Planning Commission. Again, the lead agency abused their discretion in making that decision. The FEIR is inadequate. There has been no environmental impact report for the rerouting of the Gentai Alternative 2. The FEIR is inadequate. I recommend no project since it is the most environmentally sound option. Thank you, Speaker. Ani? No Ani. The next three we have is Judge Morrison, Pat Kunzler, and Braden. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of this group, I, um, my name is John Morrison. I was born here in Eureka 86 years ago, and I'd like to note that my, my great-grandfather, who was a uh, dairy operator back in the state of Iowa, like a lot of other young men, uh, got the ambition to seek the rewards of digging gold in California. And he came, and he learned real quickly 
there's a whole lot more gold diggers than there were was gold. And he ended up with a uh, working for a uh, uh, a man who owned a herd of cattle, and his job was to herd that cattle to the to the coast and back to get all that free grass. And he managed to cross the river down near Riodale or Scotia in that area, went up what we area now we call Monument Road, and he walked out onto uh, River Ridge, and he walked along the ridge out there until he got to a place we now refer to as the, as the Smith Rock. And he found much greater rewards than he would ever have gotten by digging gold. And it was a prize, a, a matter of, of ambition on his, on his part to continue living in that area. He took the cattle back, came back the following year, a couple years before the Russ family showed up, many, many centuries, however, after the, the Weot people arrived. And he developed a, a homestead out there, and this family is still on that same parcel of land there in the Bear River area. And uh, I, um, I would like to comment about the birds. Um, yes, I'm a member of the Audubon Society, and I'm concerned about the migrating uh, Canada geese, the lesser Canada geese, the black brant, and so forth, already. <laughs> and and um, so I, I do have some great concerns. And uh, they talk about uh, there be so many uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of tax money. And our experience up here is, I think most of you realize, that tax money gets taken to Sacramento, we don't get much of it back. 15 jobs? That'd be kind of fun, but <laughs> the um, any event, I, I don't want to uh, go on with this thing too far, but uh, what I've heard here and what I've learned so far is probably the, one of the best arguments we ought to really be considering offshore wind farms. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, for Speaker. Next speaker, Pat or Braden. Pat or Braden. Um, I guess I wanted to start out by also acknowledging that we're on stolen we outland. Um, I, I think it's great that the applicant has also made that acknowledgement to some degree. Um, however, I find it incredibly disturbing that um, after supposedly having all of these knee-to-knee -knee conversations with people and listening to them and what they have to say, um, that the conclusion is then to build giant machines on the ancestral lands of a people that clearly don't want it there. Um, I, I've seen the wind farm that's down a little bit southeast of the San Francisco Bay, and driving there in the nighttime is incredibly disorienting because of those flashing red lights that they have. Um, I found it uh, that, that we need to see some, so like what, what it, we're going to expect on Bear River Ridge and Monument Ridge in the nighttime. We can't just look at it during the day. There's like two parts of the day. Um, and after having all of these conversations with people, um, for some reason, the absurd conclusion is that he wants to erect 600-foot red-eyed cyclops on the ridge line. And like, I, I just think that we, we need to kind of think with our hearts sometimes a little more and bring that in and figure out what it means to us to try to decolonize Humboldt County and the United States and the world. Um, and this, this project is not it. If, if you're looking in to the eyes of tribal members and tribal leaders and you're hearing them and, and hearing them say, we, like, the condor is so important to us and this ridge has a spiritual significance. It's clear that the applicant has heard that. I even saw him at HSU yesterday and he was talking about how um, the, 
the forests are like a church here. They're like a, a place of worship and prayer. Um, and I'm wondering if, if he would knock down churches in San Diego and just erect wind, wind turbines on it. Um, it. A lot of this just doesn't make any kind of moral sense and it's incredibly emotionally disturbing and I hope that y'all will make the right decision when it comes time um, and oppose the project and not let this to continue to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> There's Pat, Pat Kunzler, if I've pronounced it right, Pat Kunzler with a K. No Pat? All right. Then uh, Melvin Cribb, Maureen Catalina, and Kyle <coughs> Knopp. Melvin Cribb, Maureen, or Kyle? Thank you. I'm Melvin Krebb. I'd like to thank all the commissioners for being here and all the staff and everybody else that's participating in this. So I'm also speaking for my wife, Holly, the handsome woman with the short hair. Um, we oppose this project. Our aquifer is the Pepperwood Town area groundwater basin. This basin will be p polluted by an oil spill into Jordan Creek. There is no oil spill response plan. Each of these windmills is supposed to contain, and I'm sorry if I have the number wrong, because uh, 400 gallons of oil for lubrication. The towers would be immediately adjacent to two earthquake faults. Appendix T, hydrology and water quality assessment, figure 3-1 clearly shows the proposed tower location straddling the ridge line so all watersheds on both sides could receive oil spills from tower failure in an earthquake or an accidental spill during oil delivery. Individualized oil spill response plans for each watershed in the project should be prepared and reviewed by the public before they, any approval moves forward. We have lived at the north end of the Avenue of the Giants for 35 years. We will be negatively affected by the noise and air pollution caused by the batch plants running co constantly for 18 months, and that's what it says in the Maybe that's not going to be the case, but that's what it says. This project is not necessary to Humboldt County. We lose our beautiful views and get nothing back, not even electricity. Our views draw tourists from as close as the Bay Area and as far away as Europe and China. It is un an unnecessary destruction of our natural terrain and wildlife. We admit that we started out in favor of this project, but had a change of heart as soon as we heard of the much more appropriate offshore wind farm proposal. As a public trust agency, the Planning Commission cannot arbitrarily ignore the, overwhelmingly, the overwhelming public record established in opposition to this project. Thank you for considering our comments. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, Maureen or Kyle. Hello, everyone. I'm Maureen Catalina. Um, Disturbed is a really good word to describe how the citizens of Humboldt County are feeling about this project. We are deeply disturbed, and I feel like emotions should not be pushed to the side lightly. Most people in this county really don't care about money. It's not our bottom line. How we feel in our hearts and our guts, and I think everybody here knows what the right answer is to do for this county. And if you want to make immediate change, then change yourself. Use less power. Anyone spending $50,000 on solar energy is probably using too much power. <laughs> we can all use less. It's a proven fact. When you give energy cheaper to human beings, when you provide them with LED lights, they use more. They want more. They are not easily satisfied. We need to change our mentality, not manipulate the forests, by, by trying to say that we can uh, reduce the impacts. We cannot reduce the impacts. You cannot kill off the corvids and, and, and protect another species. We, we've tried this so many times. But I would urge you as the leaders of our community to really look at this and implore the citizens to do things on an individual level. We could change this crisis immediately. And speaking of a crisis, if we read the first page in the 
Army Survival Guide. Doesn't matter what equipment you have, doesn't matter what resources you have, when you lose morale, you lose. The morale of the people matters, and that's why there are World Heritage Sites, because beauty stirs the soul, and it moves people. The beauty up here cannot be replaced, and it can be destroyed quite easily with one of those horrific wind turbines. They are horrific. Would you like to look out at them? I sure wouldn't. I wouldn't wish them on anybody. And if we do have to put them in place, they're tied into the grid. Put them someplace flat and ugly. Sorry, Bakersfield, but <laughs> if I needed a skin graft, I would not take it from my forehead to keep myself alive. I would take it from someplace no one could see and where the impact would be greatly reduced. Humboldt County is gorgeous. You care about looks and I care about looks. All of us do. Y'all own mirrors? Y'all checked yourselves out before you got here? We care what we see here. It stirs our souls. And it causes us to take action. We do need to take action. We are not against alternative energy has been implied here so many times. I own seven houses in Humboldt County. Five of them are solar. That's what's happened over the last 10 years. Not like we've been told Humboldt County hasn't taken any action in the last 10 years. How dare you? Who has those statistics? We have all taken action and we all care. I say no, no, I would scream it, I would cuss it if I was allowed to. Because that's how upset I have been ever since I heard about this project. And there's many more like me that could not get here because of our terrain and our beautiful wild places. They're not here. But I tell you, in your hearts, please do the right thing. You know what it is. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Kyle. <clears throat> and following Kyle will be Ken Miller, A. Roberts, and Dominic. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Thank you for your service this, uh, this late at night and on this uh, big uh, topic. Um, uh, the city of Riedel is still currently reviewing the, the final uh, EIR, which uh, we only got a copy of, or I only got a copy of on Monday. Um, so we are wanting to make sure that we really reevaluate and make sure that um, the position of the council is well considered and thought out. We understand the importance of economic development. It's been a main focus for Rio Dell over the past few years. Um, we don't want to uh, take a position lightly. Um, one of the things that has come up that I have heard uh, put out there over the past couple weeks and even at this meeting that I feel needs to be corrected is what I want to say is that it is possible uh, to believe in man-made climate change and still have questions about this project. Uh, Rio Dell may have certain, um, uh, people may have drawn certain conclusions about Rio Dell and the character of Rio Dell, uh, and the community in the Eel River Valley in general, but I will tell you uh, that the city currently participates in the climate action plan with the county, the climate action group. We were actually uh, characterized in the paper as as a rogue city that uh, wasn't interested in uh, participating, but that actually is the farthest from the truth. We were at the table from the very beginning. Uh, this week, just this week, in working with the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, uh, we received a document that we've been working on for a number of years, which is a solar site assessment for all of our facilities. We've gone through and spent uh, a lot of money on energy efficiency upgrades. Uh, and we were also, again, originally one of the partners on the community choice uh, aggregation with uh, Redwood Coast Energy. So uh, I do just wanna, wanna correct that, that it is possible uh, to believe in man-made climate change and still have questions about this project, legitimate questions uh, that concern all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Ken Dominic or A. Roberts? Thank you. Uh, my name is Ken Miller, and um, I have a solution to your crisis, but I'm going to save it to the end. Uh, 
So, you know, one of the people have raised this issue of climate change is going to kill everything. We don't know that. We have no idea what critters will, how they will evolve. Um, the part of the reason that we're in this trouble is that we've ignored the impacts of our behavior on biodiversity. And this is a biodiversity hotspot. Humboldt County is a biodiversity hotspot. We've lost 30% of our birds worldwide. So this project is probably one of the biggest projects ever built in the county, and it is certainly the biggest ever built at elevation. All the other ones have been on flat terrain with fairly easy access. All of Terrigen's projects are basically flatland, depopulated areas. Not so here. The roads through Jordan Creek, can you imagine 200 foot road? A freeway is 12 feet. Jordan Creek is Franciscan. It's some of the most highly erodible soil on the planet. Um, you know, I looked at um, the marbled murrelet fairly closely in the, in the ER, and I can tell you that it is a joke. Putting garbage can covers on the garbage cans that are already covered, by the way. But let me tell you something. When you get rid of the corvids, guess what? The study that they've cited reveals that two-thirds of the uh, predation was by reptiles and mammals. Get rid of the corvids, you increase those. And that's just a small example of what's wrong with this. Um, a lot of this modeling has been basically a dry lab. Um, so my solution to your crisis <laughs> is um, what I recommend is that you reject this permit and let it go to elected representatives. This is too big, too consequential, too much opposition to be decided by an unelected body. And if you let it go to the Board of Soups and let Terrigen do it, that would be a very fair outcome from this. Please consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, Dominic or A. Roberts. <clears throat> Hello. I was not originally planning to speak today. I have not finished reviewing the documentation that we've only had for a few days. But there's been a couple of points that I want to address that have been made. And in order to do that, I have to give a little bit of the scope. <coughs> Humboldt County is massive. There are multiple states in this country that are smaller in footprint than Humboldt County is <coughs> by itself. Yet we have a population that could fit in a mere handful of high rises. We are very sparsely populated because we are uh, stewards of our landscape. We protect huge, vast amounts of very valuable landscape for not just the state of California, but for the world. Right now, the Amazon is burning. The Philippines are burning. There are multiple major forests that go back that are in flames right now. We do not need to add any risk to our redwoods. Every acre of of rainforest that goes up, our redwoods become infinitely more valuable for s carbon sequestration in this world. We need to s be shepherds of the land. We need to protect it. And we also need to not discount the value of the indigenous peoples and their world renewal ceremonies because that helps wake up the land and we need the land to be awake and we need the land to be alive and breathing in order to fight the climate change on our behalf. Because while man has been doing all this damage to the world, the world has been trying to heal and we need to do everything we can to help that process. There are things that we can do that do not destroy valuable areas like these ridges, that do not destroy sacred sites like these ridges. We can put trickle solar on every 
pull. We can put vertical, non-flickering turbines along our roadways where we already have poles that trickle up into the grid and are fed by the passage of cars. We have the technology to do better. This is not better. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Anyone else? Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for having the patience to wait this long into the evening and to listen to all the voices that needed to be heard. I thought you all might like an outsider's perspective. I'm a traveler. I'm traveling by bicycle. And as I rode into Petrolia and witnessed that beautiful landscape, it was a particularly hot day. I felt as though at any moment, the tinder around me could burst into flames. And it was a spell of weather like that that we experienced over this last week. I'm from Pennsylvania, and I witnessed firsthand slowly as natural gas drillers moved into my state. And I witnessed the devastation of hydraulic fracturing and saw all the, all the, all the devastation. It's just, it's mind blowing. The tentacles of the greater industrial machine that seduced my state, I feel, are just a, a further emanation and a, a tentacle now to be witnessed in this part of the country, disguised like an octopus as environmentalism. I speak um, for the Andes, I speak for the Redwoods, I speak for the Amazon, mm -hmm. which I have had the privilege to spend vast amounts of time in. <coughs> and when you grow silent and you spend time in these places, they start to speak to you. And maybe you start to listen. And those who listen best <coughs> nowadays are the remaining indigenous. They have their ears best attuned to nature. And the bullet points that nature has handed down to us are thusly, we will miss a huge opportunity to sequester carbon if we go and, as one person said, put a concrete slab on our forehead we will only further damage these vital, vital ecosystems that are all interconnected. Now I'd like to get to the part where I say what is the only thing that needs to be said, and that is, please, after you leave tonight, grow silent and ask your heart if you're doing the right thing. Please do the right thing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Humboldt. Thank you, Speaker. Mary Sanger. <coughs> Mary Sanger. My name is Mary Sanger, and I'm representing 350 Humboldt, a local climate activist organization. We're an affiliate of 350.org, which is an international organization. Uh, aiming to fight climate change. And I listen to my neighbors and my friends talk to you about the significance uh, and the beauty of our area and how the wonderful wildlife that we have, how precious it is to us. What I haven't heard is concern for the wildlife of the world not only are species here in Humboldt County threatened, but species worldwide. We're experiencing extinctions worldwide. And why is that? Because of global climate change, desertification in areas that had previously been treed, droughts, wildfires, superstorms, this is actually what this is about. And 
I feel the pain of the experience of the sacrifice that we would need that we need to make in order to do our part in fighting global climate change that affects not only us but the entire world. People that will have to move out of areas that are no longer habitable, um, people that will become climate refugees, people that will die in superstorms, people and structures that will be obliterated in wildfires. We must look at the larger picture here. While we cherish what we have here, we have to see how the, we, what we do fits into the larger picture. Fortunately, we have a major wind resource. We have a resource that we can utilize to do something about climate change. We have to leave behind or, I hate to say this, we have to see the larger picture, see what we can do. <coughs> the, the people in generations to come are depending on us. If we don't do it, then worse is going to happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Well, that exhausts my list. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak? Thank you. I did fill one out, but it didn't seem to make it on your desk. Um, my name is Dr. Tony Savaggio. I'm an environmental sociologist. Thanks for the opportunity to speak on this issue. Um, I want to spend my a lot of time co uh, commenting on the impact of tribal resources. I've provided written comments in the past, and I'm going to focus on the tribal resources piece. I believe the I EIR fails to adequately measure to avoid, minimize, compensate meaningfully for these significant impacts on we got cultural and botanical resources and the project should be denied. I would hope that most of us here are aware that indigenous people are disproportionately affected by our global climate crisis, but more often than not, these folks are excluded and ignored when we talk of climate change solutions. I am sad to say that this project is yet another example of the long history of ignoring their voices in climate change conversations. And as is too often not discussed in these deliberations is the fact that the institutions of environmental power, elected officials, government bureaucracies like this board, environmental nonprofits, and the like have been almost as a rule created by white folks and often remain dominated by white people. Now, while the community has made some strides here in Humboldt County um, uh, to bring out in the open some of these power inequalities, the legacy of racism and cultural ge genocide continues to haunt us here in Humboldt County. I believe that this project, as it is proposed, should be viewed not in the context of the fundamentals, um, but in the context of this legacy of white supremacy and the ongoing attempts to erase the history of indigenous people by destroying and despoiling their tribal landscape and resources. I find it troubling also that white folks once again are telling indigenous people that their land has to be sacrificed to adequately deal with the climate crisis, a crisis that their culture has not created. This is meaningful participation. Terrigen reps, the Chamber of Commerce folks, tell the WIAT that they recognize their cultural resources are gonna be impacted and they're very sorry, but we have to fix the mess that our industrial culture created and you and your land, you and your land uh, stand in the way once again, of progress. Sound like a familiar story? Right. It's 2019 and I ask, haven't we taken enough from them? We have a climate crisis and we need to do something about it, but we need to do something that's based on the principles of climate justice, where we do not place the burden of alternative energy projects like this on those that did not create the problem. Our society, our institutions, our decision makers like this board have a moral responsibility to safeguard the rights of the most vulnerable people and cultures and to move forward energy projects that address climate change equitably and fairly. This project is not equitable and it is not fair to the WIAT. Uh, they have told you this very clearly. Um, so once again, indigenous people bear the burdens and native land is turned into a sacrifice zone by the state, corporations, and misguided energy uh, alternative energy advocates. Climate justice will never come from a project like this um, that invite indigenous people to the table, but in the end, ignore their explicit wishes. Um, so you're all tasked with making a decision here that can either honor their wishes, um, or uh, and they've significantly laid out the impact, or deny and deny the project, or you can go uh, 
and continue the long legacy of settler colonialism in this county and ignore their voices. Um, a project like this should be, should be not allowed to go forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Speaker. Hi, my name is Susan Nesson. I live in Rio Dell. I'm here representing the moms of the world. I was born and raised in a, a South Bay uh, part of Los Angeles. We used to walk and ride our bikes to everywhere, including the beach, until our town became intolerable for me to live there. I moved here 40 years ago, government employee, lost a lot of opportunities because there's not a lot up here. But I was blessed to raise my son here, who still lives here with his wife, returned from college to come home, which I'm very fortunate. I retired after 30 years, which was 50 year, uh, I'm sorry, 15 years ago. And I painted a few bedrooms, did some landscaping, looked around, said, oh my God, what am I gonna do? I'm not used to not working. So I started volunteering at the elementary school in Rio Dell. 15 years is my 15th year. I'm in a first grade class, love it. I'm part of a program called Foster Grandparent. What we do is not only help the children to learn reading, writing, arithmetic, but we also love them. And Rio Dell needs a lot of that. We're a low income community, but we're a community. We love our children. <coughs> 10 o'clock, I go out with the kids for recess. And this last month, we've had quite a phenomenon. We hear these geese passing in V formation right over the school. And half the playground stops and waves to the birds and says, hi, see you next spring as we watch them fly over monument and out of our sight. I personally don't have any statistics. I didn't know that, that we were on a flight pattern, but it makes sense, we see it. A month ago, we were in the 14, I'm sorry, Ferndale Bottoms at the pumpkin patch, and I looked up in our hills and knew how blessed I was to be able to live here for the last 40 years. Please, this is not a good idea. We have an ocean wind power out there. Please, do not destroy my son's legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. We, we have a, go ahead, come, come forward. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rob, uh, Rob McBeth, uh, Humboldt County. Been here long, longer than I'd like to remember. Um, we, we talk about alternative energy and approximately 30% of our energy in the U.S. comes from coal. About 35% comes from natural gas, which involves fracking. So 65% when we plug in our cell phone or we plug in our electric car is coming from gas and, oil and uh, coal. I think we need some alternatives. About 17%, I believe, comes from alternative energy. This is an, uh, an opportunity to help offset that. Um, also, I hear people talking about microgrids and solar and that type of thing. This isn't an either or. There's no reason they can't do both. I would hope that the people who are in uh, looking for that or in favor of that could get together and make that happen. I support the project and urge you to move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. John Schaefer. Good evening, John Schaefer. I live in Arcata. Thank you ever so much for putting up with us. It's almost nine o'clock. I hope I'm last. Um, <laughs> I believe we're in a climate crisis and we need to do something about it. We all of us need to do something about it, even in Humboldt County. I would second what this previous speaker just said. It's not an either or. It's not, either, it's not microgrids or solar or biomass or this wind project. We need to do all of them if we are going to save our grandchildren from a really bleak future. And I'll close just be speaking about my granddaughter when she was eight. She expressed a fear that by the time she grows up and her children grow up and her grandchildren grow up, 
she's afraid it'll be too hot to be alive. Now that was some years ago and they have since been evacuated twice for wildfires. Wildfires are not just PG&E's fault, they're the fault of the climate crisis, so we need to take all of those things into account. Please, what I hope you will do is approve this project and, and permit our grandchildren to have a future. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please, please approach the podium. <clears throat> Thanks for having us. Uh, make this real brief. I'm a beekeeper in Shively. All my neighbors hate this idea. This is ridiculous that it's even come this far. I stand with all these people against this project, and I'm very in support of the Weot tribe. I think we should listen to them. We're starting to acknowledge this here. This should be something that we acknowledge about ourselves. We're finally becoming more conscious. And this is wrong. We have much more intellect here and creativity. We don't need these outside forces here. I mean, really, if you want to know about solar, why don't you ask the people in the hills that have been working on it for 70 years, for, since the 70s? I mean, come on, building a facility on the Avenue of the Giants? Are you kidding me? People come from all over the world for the Avenue of the Giants. Now you're going to build a facility? for this company from Manhattan. Why don't you go back to Manhattan? Hey, please, please, fix please, Manhattan. Please address the commission. Okay, I think they should go back to the stolen <laughs> island of Manhattan and fix Manhattan. We don't need their help here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Anyone else wishing to comment? Please approach the podium. Anyone? Dan Berger, I'm from Petrolia. I live downwind of the project site. First thing I did when I got out there in the fall, when I smelled smoke, I went out and I got a 2,500 gallon tank and I hooked a fire pump to it and bought three feet, 300 feet of fire hose. I think that's a good solution to a lot of the problems we have. I just wanted to put that out there. If you look at the science, as I have done for the last six months, it's already too late. And if you want to do something, you basically have to stop flying, stop driving, grow food locally, and take care of your own backyard. They're here to make a profit. They don't really care what they do to draw down carbon. This doesn't draw down carbon, it just substitutes some electricity for carbon producing electricity. If you don't believe the science, don't build it, see what happens. But if you look at the science, we're, we're basically gonna suffer. This would be one third of 1% of California's electricity. You would need 300 installations like this. And the science says, it's still not going to help. We are a fraction, a tiny fraction of this problem. Please don't destroy that ridge and don't threaten the forest. Thank you, Speaker. Anyone else wishing to comment? Anyone? Seeing no one, we'll close the public comment for the night and we'll bring it back. Uh, and, um, Director, if uh, you could maybe uh, let the folks know yeah, what, what I would, the uh, agenda is going to be for the, the balance of this uh, project. Sure. Thank you, Chair Morris. What uh, we plan on doing for the next meeting is going through and responding to the questions from the commission and uh, many of the other things that have been brought, brought up tonight. Some of it will be as simple as pointing out in the FEIR where the information is located and then uh, bring that information back to you with uh, documents that would allow you to consider the uh, project uh, formally. Um, so we would recommend that you continue this to the meeting of November 14th at 4 p.m. Um, and at that meeting, uh, this would be a continuation with the public hearing open. 
so the public can continue to comment on both the things that we present that haven't been seen before and and also if people haven't commented previously they have the ability to do that and and then I would imagine the Commission will continue to receive public input and uh, once public input is completed the Commission will we assume begin to deliberate and if that uh, can happen within the meeting of the 14th um, that is an alternative but we've also set aside the meeting of the 21st for the continuance of the Commission's uh, deliberation of this and we're set to have uh, four meetings this month or three uh, we're set to have three so the the seventh for tonight the 14th and the 21st that's what we're the schedule we've got set that is correct okay thank you Noah mm -hmm. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure I, you know, I, I appreciate what Director Ford just said about having taken down um, a lot of the questions from, from the public, also from the commission. Um, there were a few specific questions that I would have liked to ask um, that based on the initial presentation and on things that were comment made by the public. Can I submit those to you by email and uh, have them be incorporated into the list. Of yes. Okay. Thank you. Mike. And that was the same question that I had because I was waiting to okay. ask a few more questions. So I'll submit them. So is that uh, the rest of the commissioners uh, have that elective also? Yes. So, okay. Fine. Any other comments uh, before we adjourn tonight? Well, with that, if, I, I just wanted to thank you all. Uh, you guys make a really passionate case. Um, and, and the presenters, uh, Nathan as well. I mean, you made a, a very good presentation. But, um, but yeah, there was a, a lot of really persuasive argument tonight. Thanks for the time that you spent on it. So then, I guess to be official, we need to have a continuous motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move to continue this hearing to the 14th of November at 4 p.m. Second. We have a motion and second for, to continue this until the 14th. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The project is continued until tonight. Same time, same place.